Okay, good morning. Welcome everyone. I'm pleased to call to order the 276th meeting of the Pacific Fishery Management Council in Seattle, Washington. This meeting is open to the public and copies of the meeting agenda and other documents used by the council during this meeting are available on the council's website. We encourage members of the public to testify and provide the council with comments on issues before the council at this meeting. Please note that the webinar chat feature should be used for technical issues and not to make public comment. To comment on an agenda item, you must sign up on our electronic public comment portal available on, on the April council meeting webpage. After public comment has begun on an item, no more names will be taken to testify. Each person has one opportunity to testify on each agenda item. Testimony on behalf of another person not in attendance will only be allowed within the period allowed for the person in attendance. Generally, I will limit individual testimony to five minutes for individuals and 10 minutes for groups or individuals representing organizations. We have a visual countdown timer that shows your remaining time allotment. Anyone wishing to include written electronic comments in support of your verbal testimony, please submit them in electronic format to the electronic portal when you sign up for your testimony. Written comments must relate directly to your oral testimony to be accepted at this stage. After you speak to the agenda item, the comments will be posted and made part of the official record of this meeting. The meeting is being recorded and live streamed over the internet. Copies of the recording will be available by contacting the council office. Let me remind council members and others to speak directly into your microphones so that all can hear. Um, I ask that all council members and members of the audience turn off the sound ringers on your cell phones and mute your connections while the council meeting is in session. And while we cannot bring uh, any donuts into the council room this, uh, this meeting, the Anderson rule is in effect. And um, if, you, uh, if your phone just goes off, we will... Uh, We'll roll over those obligations of three donuts minimum into the June meeting. Um, I would like to also add that the uh, Kurt Melcher is, um, has retired from the ODFW uh, director position, and the uh, interim director, Davia Palmieri, will be in his place on that position until uh, re permanent replacement has been, um, has been named. I would also um, just note that uh, we are in Seattle, and, the, and uh, we may have some uh, University of Washington grad students, fishery grad students uh, in the audience, and uh, just like to take the time to welcome them to the council family and ask any questions they may have. Um, and with that, um, I'll turn to uh, Mr. Merrick Burton to roll call of council members. Merrick? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, council members. Uh, I will now call the roll of the April 2024 meeting of the Pacific Fishery Management Council. Uh, Heather Hall. Here. Phil Anderson. Here. Uh, Michael Clark. Here. Robert Dooley. Here. Lieutenant Kerry Jeffries. Here. Danny Evanson. Here. Mark Gorelnik. Present. Pete Hassemer. Present. David Hogan. Sharon Kiefer. Here. Lynn Mattis. Present. Joseph Oatman. Here. Chris Oliver. Here. Brad Penninger. Here. Corey Writings. Here. Butch Smith. Here. Krista Svensson. Present. Frank Lockhart. Here. And Marcy Yuremko. Here. And that concludes the roll, Mr. Chairman, and you have a quorum. Very good. All right, with that, um, I'll note that we have a, the, the agenda before us and um, the, uh, the approval of the agenda item. Move to approve the agenda. All right, second by Danny Evanson. Second. Thank you, Danny. Okay, uh, with that, um, all those in favor of the agenda, um, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay? Uh, abstentions? All right, motion passes unanimously. Very good. All right, thank you. And um, with that, I'll turn to Executive Director Merrick Burton for his report. 
Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is agenda item A4, the executive director's report. Uh, the executive director's report to the Pacific Fishery Management Council typically provides information on informational reports, changes to council membership, advisory body and committee alternates that are in place for their current meeting, activities of staff and council members that have occurred since the last meeting, and other updates not announced elsewhere that may warrant summarization. Um, just a top level message here, since it hasn't been much time since our March meeting, there's not a whole lot to report on. Uh, just from the start here on the council roster, uh, my ED report indicated there has not been a change. Uh, we do have a change. Uh, the, the director of Oregon Fish and Wildlife has formerly retired, Mr. Kurt Melcher, and as the chairman indicated, we do have an interim director at the moment. There are several informational reports. Uh, um, some of those are supplemental. We have two supplemental reports in addition to the one outlined in my report to you. Uh, the two supplemental reports are a trawl rationalization compliance summary and a second uh, supplemental report regarding federal funding for the California uh, 2023 salmon uh, disaster. There are also several advisory body alternates, <clears throat> as indicated there in my uh, written report to you all. Um, and also uh, of note are a couple of uh, new staff that have joined us here uh, for the first council meeting, and I'd like to introduce them to you all. Uh, first, we have uh, Miss Angela Forrestall over here. Uh, and if you would uh, take the time to introduce yourself to Angela when you have a moment, uh, she's shadowing Robin through this meeting, uh, learning the ropes of the salmon process. Uh, we also have Ms. Samantha Holland. Uh, good morning. And if you have a moment, please uh, take your time to introduce yourself to Samantha. Samantha is shadowing Renee at this meeting and uh, learning the ropes of meeting and events management. So uh, please uh, help me to welcome them to our council family. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we do have uh, some additional general information for you all uh, in the briefing book. Uh, one concerns uh, just the COVID issue, uh, which is going to be present with us forever at this point, uh, in addition to just general guidance regarding uh, health and wellness. So if you are uh, not feeling well, please wear a mask. Uh, we do have the ability for you to take the meeting from your room if you're not feeling well. So I would encourage you all to do that just to minimize the spread of illness throughout the council meeting. Uh, we also have a chairman's reception this evening. Uh, it'll be taking place uh, right outside here, uh, beginning at 6 p.m. Uh, this afternoon, this evening rather. Uh, so that uh, concludes uh, my executive director's report, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Um, any questions for executive director Burton? Okay. Very good. Okay, that will take us to um, open comment. And I believe we have, I believe we have one, and that's Dan Platt. Dan, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Um, I'm here uh, actually representing the Noyo Harbor District, and I'm going to read into the record a uh, letter that was brought by a concerned citizen in Fort Bragg to our Harbor Commission and approved uh, to, uh, by the Commission to read to the Council. Dear Council Advisory Committees and Technical Teams, on behalf of the Commissioners of the Noyo Harbor District of Fort Bragg, California, I'm writing to you to express our deepest concerns over the extreme regular, regulatory uh, changes that occurred in our California salmon and nearshore rockfish fisheries in 2023 and the impacts it has placed on our harbor, our commercial and recreational uh, fishing fleets and our local economy. Since the decline of logging and lumber mill operations, the city of Fort Bragg and the coastal Mendocino County has relied on tourism and fishing to sustain our local economy. Like the rest of the country, 2020 and 2021 were filled with challenges due to the coronavirus pandemic.
and pandemic. The 2023 decision to completely close salmon season presented additional stress to our already fragile local economy and resulted in loss of hundreds of jobs. To further complicate the 2023 situation, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife rapidly implemented, implemented an overly broad and burdensome emergency closure to the recreational nearshore fishery due to concerns about Quebec, uh, the Quebec population. A decision made from data that is already many years old. The Noyo Harbor District and our facilities stand as the first line of support services for the local commercial and recreational fishing fleets. As a designated fishing village, our harbor is the hub of fishing activity, support services, and an area of safe refuge for mariners between Humboldt Bay and Bodega Bay. In addition to the severe negative e impacts to our commercial salmon fleet, the 2023 uh, closure of salmon season also had negative impacts to our commercial uh, passenger fishing fleet, with many of our operators losing up to 70% of their business. This would be further exasperated by the sudden emergency closure of the recreational rockfish season. While it is true that fishing for rockfish remained open outside of the 50 fathom boundary line, the reality is that most of our fleet, our local fleet of recreational anglers operate from small boats and they can only venture that far offshore on the calmest of days, thereby um, creating an increased risk level for many anglers. Many recreational anglers choose not to fish due to the increased dangers of fishing offshore, while others chose to push the envelope, placing their lives and the crew in potentially dangerous situations. As a community who rise, who relies, whose economy relies on uh, tourism and fishing, this perfect storm of closures affecting our two most popular fisheries was devastating. Here in the harbor, we experienced significant declines in revenues from our permanent and seasonal slip occupation, occupancy, as well as launch fees. The businesses in the adjacent communities as well as our harbor experience cancellation reservations for hotels, vacation rentals, and campsites. Fishing and marine equipment stores experience reduced sales as well as area restaurants. The Noyo Harbor District wants sustainable fisheries not only for our commercial and recreational fishing fleets, but also for the health of our ocean and rivers. We understand that setting seasons is a multi-step process and many agencies involved in the regula regulatory process. We, along with other coastal communities, rely on you and other agents, agencies to set seasons using the best available science. As you move closer to deciding on options for the 2024 salmon season and nearshore rockfish season, please consider the following. Salmon. Identified on pages 58 and 59 of your February 2024 review of ocean salmon fishing's document, both the FRC SRFC SR, and KFR 
see runs exceeded their escapement goals with the FRC at um, 138, 638, or 133,638. Uh, and the uh, KFRC at 60,017 uh, over the goal. Allow for the term, uh, allow for the return of commercial and recreational salmon fishing in California, near shore rockfish. Conduct hook and line surveys to ascertain the current idea of Quebec populations. Allow recreational fishing for near shore rockfish with zero retention of Quebecs. Um, require a, a descending a voice device to be on board vessel, any vessel fishing for rockfish. In closing, the Noyo Harbor District opposes similar closures to the 2024 salmon and their shore rockfish seasons without more updated surveys and modeling that utilizes the best data retrieval methods available and establishes regulations that are overly broad and burdensome to our local economy and interests. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Dan. Uh, questions for Dan on his testimony? Uh, Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. <clears throat> Dan, thanks for reading the report. I noticed in in season that you, uh, that same report was submitted, but only the look appears to be the second page. I would hope we could get the full report posted somehow. I know it's beyond the briefing book, Dave. And yeah, uh, Bob, I actually uh, mentioned that to the secretariat and they're going to help me with that. Perfect. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thanks, Bob. Anyone else? Okay. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Okay. okay. And I don't see. Uh, no more signups, so we'll take care of public comment. And we'll take us to um, habitat issues. So with that, we'll look to the habitat committee report and uh, Dr. Corey Green. Corey, are you there? Can you hear me? We can. Welcome. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the council. I'm going to read agenda item C1A. The supplemental HC1 report, Habitat Committee report on current habitat issues, and we have um, update on the draft supplemental EIS for Hell's Canyon complex relicensing. The most recent estimated deadline for the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to produce the draft environmental impact statement is the end of April 2024, with a likely 60-day comment period. The hydropower license was last updated in 2005 and has been operating under an extension of the original license. As mandated under the Magnuson-Stevens Act, the Council is required to comment on actions that, in the view of the Council, are likely to substantially affect the habitat, including essential fish habitat, of an anadromous fishery resource under its authority. Of further importance and consideration is that this area, current be currently below the dams and historically above, is primary Snake River production area for fall Chinook salmon, which are the most significant snake basin contributor for salmon ocean fisheries in the Council. The Habitat Committee is ready to draft a comment letter on the, Hells, on the draft Hell's Canyon Supplemental EIS for the June briefing book for Council review. Habitat-related topics of interest are likely to include flow management, habitat improvements, and water quality considerations. In addition to this, there's several um, other topics coming up in late spring. Several other actions are likely to be reduced, re re released for comment between late May and July, and warrant discussion about which should be prioritized for review by the Habitat Committee. These include the Dredge Material Management Plan Draft EIS, the Draft Programmatic EIS for California's Offshore Wind Leases, the Humboldt Bay EIR for the Deep Draft Terminal Project, Bureau of Ocean Energy and Management's Proposed Sale Notice for Oregon Offshore Wind Lease Areas, 
and their environmental assessment on the site assessment and characterization for Oregon offshore wind energy areas. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Corey. Uh, questions on the Habitat Committee report? Report? Okay. Not see any? Okay. Thanks, Corey. All right. That takes us to public comment. If we don't have that. And then uh, to council action. Um, there's an EIS coming out here um, shortly, and uh, there's been Habitat Committee has expressed their uh, availability to for a comment letter. So, for that, so um, Sharon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do agree with the proposal from the Habitat Committee to brief. Uh, create a, a comment letter for council review for the June briefing book. I certainly hope that that EIS stays on schedule so that we do have that opportunity. Very good. Anyone else? Thoughts on that? I see some heads head nods. Okay. All right. Okay. Very good. Uh, Carrie. I think I should have went to you first, shouldn't have I? <laughs> Thank you. If you're done with your discussion. It's my Monday morning. <laughs> no problem. I just wanted to flag for everyone that there is some written public comment under this agenda item. It's mostly salmon production and habitat related. There's no one, uh, there's no, there's, I don't think there's any sign. Well, yeah, there's no sign up, as you already know, but I just wanted to let you know that there is something in the uh, written record under public comment. Great. All right. Oh, oh. Uh, Mark Rowley. Uh, thank you, Chair Pettinger. Um, it has been some time since the council has weighed in on water management in California. And typically, we ask the Habitat Committee or the Habitat Committee on its own initiative uh, brings forward recommendations and a draft letter. Um, and I, I'm, I'm wondering if this is the appropriate time or the appropriate mechanism for asking the Habitat Committee um, to provide some input or recommendations to the council at the June meeting on California, in including perhaps uh, a draft letter if they think that's appropriate. If this is not the right time, I apologize. Let me know when it is. Executive Director Burton, Carrie? Um, was <clears throat> sorry. It, was the question directed at me or more generally? I thought you were asking other council members. Sorry. Um, I was sort of assumed we were in council discussion on the Habitat Committee report, and you noted the um, public comment we received um, on, on this issue, and that prompted me to ask whether now would be the appropriate time, or maybe workload planning might be the appropriate time for us to ask the Habitat Committee to have a discussion and perhaps provide a recommendation. Got it, thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Gorelnik. Um, uh, maybe uh, the best way to move forward would be to um, uh, look at sort of what uh, comment opportunities and public notices and sort of vehicles might be coming down the pike and we could cir circle back at uh, future meeting planning. Um, you know, if you, if the council wanted to direct the Habitat Committee to start looking at that and maybe report back in June, um, we could do that. But at a minimum, uh, I could confer with the director and um, the Habitat Committee chair and vice chair and um, circle back later at this meeting, if that seems like an appropriate way. Great, thanks. I just didn't want to let that workload planning is days away. I just <laughs> yeah. wanted to make sure we put a pin in that. There you go. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Anyone else? Okay, Kerry. If there's no further discussion, then that uh, concludes your business for this agenda item. Very good. Uh, with that, I'll uh, hand the gavel to uh, Vice Chair Hasmer. I believe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Cruising right along this morning. Um, that will take us into Pacific Halibut Management. Yeah. And we have some chairs to switch around here.
stand down for a minute to look. Let's. Let's take a break for a couple minutes. We're waiting for Robin, who's busy in the salmon process, to come up, who will be in the staff chair. So um, let's start again in four minutes. <laughs> All right, by my clock, that four minutes has passed as fast as the previous agenda items. So let's resume our session here, and I'm going to turn the floor over to Robin Elke. Robin, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Vice Chair. This is agenda item D1, the incidental catch limits for the 2024 salmon troll fishery. This is final action. So under our catch sharing plan, the area 2A allocates 15% of the non-tribal commercial halibut allocation to the salmon troll fishery as incidental catch. The primary management objective outlined in the catch sharing plan is to harvest the incidental quota during the April through June salmon troll fishery with the secondary objective to harvest any remaining quota from the July through the remainder of the salmon troll fishery. The council has successfully used landing limits or landing ratios and a total trip limit to ensure that the ensure the manageable progression of the fishery in past years. A summary of that information for the incidental halibut fishery is provided in attachment one. The current, which is April 1 through May 15, landing restrictions are no more than one halibut per Two Chinook, except one halibut may be landed without meeting the ratio requirement and no more than 35 halibut may be landed per trip. At the March meeting, the council adopted for public review the following three options for incidental halibut retention in the 2024 salmon troll fishery beginning May 16. Uh, so your three options, uh, option one is status quo where the license holder may land no more than one Pacific halibut per two Chinook except one Pacific halibut may be landed without meeting the ratio requirement and no more than 35 halibut landed per trip. Option two, same as uh, option one, except for the uh, no more than 30 halibut may be landed per trip. And option three is the same, except for no more than 25 may be landed per trip. So the landing restrictions adopted for the start of the salmon season beginning May 16 through 2024 will also be in effect from April 1 through May 15 of 2025, unless modified through in-season action or until superseded by the 2025 management measures. So the council's action under this agenda item is to adopt for uh, as final the landing restrictions for Pacific halibut caught incidentally in the non-tribal salmon troll fishery from May 16 through 2024 through the end of the 2024 salmon troll season and uh, prior to the effective date of the 2025 management measures for salmon unless modified in season. 
for your reference material, you have, as I mentioned, attachment one, which is a summary of the trip limits and harvest and allocation uh, for uh, the halibut in the salmon troll fishery and uh, any public com comment that we might uh, receive under this agenda item. And that wraps up my summary for you. Thank you, Robin. Before we jump into the reports, I'll quickly look around, see if there are any questions on the overview. Not seeing any questions. We have a salmon advisory sub panel report. Mr. Ryan Johnson is here to give that. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, good morning, Council. <clears throat> I'll be reading the SAS uh, report on incidental halibut catch limits for the 2024 through 2025 salmon troll fishery. <clears throat> the SAS recommends the following catch limits for final adoption. Option one, open May 16, 2024 through the end of the 2024 salmon troll fishery and beginning April 1, 2025 till modified through in-season action or superseded by the 2025 management measures. License holders may land no more than one Pacific halibut or two Chinook, except one Pacific halibut may be landed without meeting the ratio requirement, no more than 35 halibut landed per trip. The SAS discussed the topic of incidental halibut retention in the troll fishery. The SAS is confident that this ratio and trip limit will result in a successful fishery and is the best match to meet the objectives and priorities of the catch sharing plan. Landing ratios and trip limits have been a successful management tool and combined with in-season protocols are used to assure that the allocation is not exceeded and allow for adjustments as needed. <clears throat> the SAS um, continues to recommend that the council work with National Marine Fisheries Service to re-examine the permit application deadline for the directed incidental sable fish and incidental salmon fisheries. Current deadlines require permit applications to be submitted before the seasons are established and therefore don't allow the licensees to apply for the ideal fishery for that year. <clears throat> um, we thank NIMPS for the response in March. Um, just wanted to check in again after having uh, heard comments in our April SAS meeting. So thank you. That concludes our statement. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Johnson on the Salmon Advisory Subpanel Report. See no questions. Thanks, Ryan. That would take us to public comment. We have no public comment signups. So the next step is council discussion and action. As a refresher, I'm anticipating your council action will appear before you on the screen. There it is. So I'll look to see if there are any hands to initiate discussion. Heather Hall. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, and maybe I'll just start with the question to uh, Frank, if you have any updates on the, the comment from the SAS on the uh, timing for the licenses for each year. Uh, we don't have any updates at this point in time. So okay, sorry. thank you. And I uh, do appreciate your, your thinking about it and um, the, the challenge with trying to decide which license to apply for when things are in flux. Um, so thank you for that. Appreciate it. Further discussion? Phil, Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, just wanted to express support for the SAS rec recommendation. Um, you know, in, in reviewing the um, history of the fishery here that's uh, provided to us um, in our attachment one. As we look through the catch data versus the allocation, you can see that through uh, 2019, uh, for the most part, the salmon troll fishery was able to catch nearly all of its um, allocation. There were some years where in-season action was necessitated to actually slow the catch down to try to ensure that there um, were some halibut left to account for incidental catches. The 
trollfish removed through the uh, latter part of the summer. And then you can see that in, uh, particularly in the, where we started with the COVID area um, and, and a lot of things in fisheries, including the salmon troll fishery got turned upside down. Um, they were, they were, did not catch their allocation. Um, we also had some, um, I th the geographic distribution of salmon as it relates to the geographic distribution of halibut also um, plays a sig significant role in terms of the number of halibut bycatch that the trollers uh, encounter. Um, we have had a more southerly distribution off of Washington of Chinook salmon uh, in a, for a couple of years, which uh, also deviates uh, from the distribution that, we've, that we saw in years from 2019 and previous. So um, whether it's ocean clim climatic conditions, temperature, what, you know, I'm not sure what has, what caused that change, but the combination of those two things, that being the impact of COVID on the fishery and the distribution of uh, Chinook salmon, particularly in the last couple of years, has resulted in their catching less than than the um, allocation. Um, you know, impossible for any of us to know exactly what will happen here in the future, but I think maintaining that one plus one per two uh, and the 35 catch limit is a reasonable thing to move forward. I think it will give them an opportunity to catch their allocation uh, again, depending on some of those other factors that, that we can't control. Um, and it also, I think, is consistent with the catch sharing plan of ensuring that there are halibut provided or um, an opportunity provided for the retention of incidental halibut uh, that goes with the uh, salmon troll fishery, particularly for Chinook salmon. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Further discussion? Not seeing any. Heather Hall? Thank you. I do have a motion. Let's go ahead with that. I move the council adopt the option one catch limit for the 2024 salmon fishery as described in the supplemental salmon advisory subpanel report under agenda item D1A, April 2024. Option one, open May 16th, 2024 through the end of the 2024 salmon troll fishery and beginning April 1, 2025, until modified through in-season action or superseded by the 2025 management measures. License holders may land no more than one Pacific halibut per two Chinook, except one Pacific halibut may be landed without meeting the ratio requirement and no more than 35 halibut uh, landed per trip. That language appears accurate and complete. You agree? Yes, it does. Thank you. Is there a second to the motion? Seconded by Lynn Mattis. Please speak to your motion. Thank you. Um, I think um, the SAS put a lot of thought into the range that they uh, put out for public review. I know they're doing that at a time when uh, salmon seasons are uncertain and there's a lot of discussion going on. Um, and so uh, with their recommendation for the status quo, I think it aligns with, um, as they say, their best match to meet the objectives in the cat sharing plan. Um, I know that uh, we've used this uh, ratio for several years, and I uh, really appreciate the comments of Mr. Anderson in describing um, how that was really challenged in the post COVID years. I think many times I've spoken about that relative to Washington recreational fisheries and the, how our, uh, the disruption to several of our sectors during those post COVID years. So um, I think this is a good uh, place to start and that, that covers it. Thank you. Thank you. 
Are there questions to the maker of the motion for clarification? Not seeing any questions, discussion on the motion. Seeing no discussion, I will call the question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. I believe that completes the work, but I'm going to turn to Robin here and check in. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Yes, your work under this agenda item is complete. The council has adopted option one, which is essentially a status quo. And uh, we will include this information in the upcoming uh, salmon uh, reports as well. So this will be part of the salmon regulation package now that you've made your final decision on the halibut as well. All right, so that does it. Thank you. Okay, and before we close this, I always look around for closing comments, discussion, Marcy Remco. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, just to follow up really quick, if I may, for NIMFS on the permit deadline item. Can you tell us how many permits have been issued for 2024? Um, I cannot right now, but I might be able to get some help uh, from online. So um, uh, I can... If, if you can wait a little bit, I'm. Yes, thank you. Not urgent. I'm I'm just curious. Um, attachment one doesn't provide us the information. So I'm just wondering what our numbers look like. Thank you. While we're waiting, that information might come through. I'll see if there are any other hands. Frank, maybe rather than delaying, although we're going really fast, <laughs> but uh, uh, we can provide that in in a little bit. Um, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm I'm looking for the the dots uh, on on the thing and not seeing it right now, so I don't know what to do. We can get it to you later, um, or we can wait a few more a few more minutes for staff to give me the information. Thanks. Tell you what we're going to do. We're moving very fast. Our next item is salmon. And uh, just to make sure everybody's here, before we close this agenda item, let's take a 10 minute break and come back here. And then we can finish up this, see if we have additional information and then move on to our next agenda item. So let's take 10 minute break here.
<laughs> All right, we're ready to come back into session here. And when we were we left, we were just finishing up item D1, uh, anticipating some information. I'm going to turn to Frank Lockhart, see if we have any news. Um, just to let you know, we have some information, but not, not all of it. We will, um, council staff had a good idea. We can provide this information at some future salmon agenda item. We'll get the complete information. But right now what we have uh, we have about 150 directed commercial um, licenses uh, and about 30 sablefish directed uh, uh, licenses, combined permits. So we don't have the salmon numbers. That's going to have to come in, in the future. So we'll, we'll, we'll provide that. Uh, it's probably going to be Monday because the staffer who has those numbers uh, was not expecting to work this weekend. So it'll probably be Monday. All right. Thanks for that reminder. It might seem like Monday for us, but uh, for a large number of people, it's Saturday. So um, with that, I'll look around and see if there are anything else on this agenda item. And I am not seeing any hands, so that completes our work here. And that will move us into... Excuse me while I wake up my computer into E1 on salmon management. And again, I'll look to Robin for the overview. Um, let's pause just a second, Robin. There are a couple of seats need to change. All right, thanks for that. Robin, I'll let you go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. This is agenda item E1, the National Marine Fisheries Service Report. Uh, we're gonna check in with the NIMPS West Coast Region and the uh, Fishery Science Centers to give us any updates on recent developments relative to salmon. Um, under this agenda item, we'll hear from uh, Susan Bishop on any regulatory activities, and we have Steve Lindley here to provide any updates on the Fishery Science Center activities. Um, just council discussion and comment under this agenda item, and that summarizes my report. All right, thank you. Questions on the overview? And I don't see any questions on that. Uh, this is the NIMS report. Um, we got most of those reports in March, but I will look to Ms. Susan Bishop, see if there's anything additional or any comments you want to provide at this time. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I do not have anything in terms of regulatory activities, and so I will um, defer to my uh, Science Center colleagues and the report that they have. All right, thank you. With that, Mr. Steve Lindley is here with us to give us a presentation. Good morning. Oh, good morning, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the council. Uh, in the interest of keeping things moving here quickly, I will have just two brief reports to share with you. Uh, the first one is an update on uh, some status reviews that the science centers have been doing on Chinook salmon. Uh, it really, it's been a couple of years since this has been picking up where uh, a number of Chinook salmon ESUs have been petitioned for listing due to the concerns about the status of the spring run portions of those evolutionarily significant units. So the science centers have been working to conduct status reviews of them, and that includes Oregon Coast Chinook Salmon, Southern Oregon and Northern California Coastal Chinook Salmon, Washington Coast Chinook Salmon, and the Upper Klamath Trinity River Chinook Salmon. Um, and the map shows where those all are. You're probably familiar with them, and I guess we can move to the next slide. So uh, the agency does receive petitions from interested people uh, requesting that we change the listing status of uh, salmon ESUs. And we have received a number of these, as I mentioned, due to concerns about the status of spring run Chinook salmon. And this was probably spurred due to developments in the understanding of the genetic basis of run timing, which was uh, kind of a, a very fascinating discovery. 
uh, that overturned a lot of thinking about the genetic basis of uh, the ecotypic differentiation of these species and raised a lot of kind of thorny questions about how you conserve that kind of biodiversity. Uh, anyway, in response to these petitions, the Science Center conducts a careful evaluation of all of the available information relating to the identity of evolutionarily significant units and their biological status. The Science Center does not make the listing determination. We produce a report that is handed to our regional colleagues, and they look at that along with some other considerations that we don't evaluate to come up with a final determination. So I just want to give you an update on where we're at with these petitions. So the next slide. Uh, Oregon Coast and Sonk Chinook were handled together, a lot of similarities with them. These are watersheds that uh, are in, in Oregon and Northern California, uh, not including the Upper Klamath River. Uh, we received the, that petition in August of 2022, and the 90-day finding, which is an initial evaluation of the evidence presented by the petitioners, uh, was accepted. So the Science Centers formed a review team They've been working diligently over the past year and a half or so and have just completed their status review report, which is uh, now posted online. You can see the link there if you want to take a look at that. And the high level overview of that is that there is no change to the ESU configuration. And this is a question that is one of the thorny ones in here of how you evaluate um, whether different run types are in the same ESU or in different ones. You may notice that um, depending on the ESU, you can have either configuration um, the overall ESUs, both of them were found to be at low risks, although there were concerns about the spring run and coastal portions of the Sonk ESU in particular that does seem to be at some risk in and of itself, but does not um, raise the overall concern for the ESU. In terms of the, the process, we do expect to see a proposed decision sometime in the next few months this spring. That will be posted in the Federal Register. There'll be a public comment period and then a final decision in about a year. Moving on to Washington Coast. Um, this one was received just this last July. So the centers are actively conducting this research uh, right now. And we, we don't really have any uh, thing more to share than that is in progress. And then finally, there, there's no slide for this, but the Upper Klamath Trinity River, this one was the one we started on first. The Science Centers did complete a review, but um, essentially this is on pause due to a mutual agreement between the petitioner, petitioners and the fishery service, uh, not wanting to do anything that would disrupt the removal of the Klamath dams. A change in listing status would introduce serious uncertainty into that process that nobody thought would be desirable. Everyone wants those dams out at least those involved in this listing petition would like these dams out as soon as possible because it is the most um, single greatest thing you could do for Chinook salmon in that basin. Um, so with that, I, I guess I can take questions about this portion before I switch gears, if there are any. Right, any questions for Dr. Lindley on the status reviews? Corey Ridings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Dr. Lindley. Um, my question is something you mentioned at the beginning about the, the genetic basis of the run timing has turned over some of the thinking and the ecotypic differences in biodiversity. Can you talk a little bit of, more about that to help us understand what that is exactly? Sure. Thank you for your question, Corey. Uh, originally, people thought looking, this is work really read by the, led by the Northwest Fisheries Science Center, Robin Waples in particular, and the team there looking at the genetic differentiation among Chinook salmon across their range. And they noted that the run timing, this can be called an ecotype spring versus fall run, um, was found in, in many watersheds. And that typically the rivers, the, the populations that were most close together within a river basin with different run timing would often be most closely related. So spring run Chinook, say in the, um, the upper Klamath would be more closely related to fall run in that in the same tributary, tributary, say the Salmon River, than they would be to spring run Chinook in the Rogue or, or the lower Columbia or upper Columbia. Um, and it was thought because of this and the fact that uh, most genetic differentiation was thought to be the result of many different genetic alleles of small effect adding together that these 
Run timing differences probably evolved independently many, many times in different watersheds throughout the range of Pacific salmon. It was found later that that's not true. Uh, there are a number of traits that underlie commonly recognized ecotypes in Pacific salmon that seem to be related to a single gene or a super gene that uh, evolved once and then spread through migration across the range of salmon. And it, you end up with, the, for Chinook salmon, this very complicated mosaic uh, of different life history types throughout the range. And in the case of, of uh, Upper Klamath Trinity and the, all of these ESUs for that matter, the spring run Chinook salmon in these sub basins are closely related to the fall run Chinook in those basins at everywhere in their genome except these small regions that determine the run timing. And then those regions share a common ancestry. So that indicates this is uh, these differentiations have occurred through migration, not through evolution, uh, parallel evolution within the basins. That was probably very complicated. Uh, hopefully you follow me on, on that. This, it is really, really complicated if you're not up to the, the genomic uh, stuff, which I barely get myself being a, an oceanographer. So hopefully that didn't make matters even worse for you. Okay. All right. Thanks. Further questions for Dr. Lindley. Not seeing any hands. I do have one question. On the Oregon coast and Sunk Chinook slide, um, they, there's one ESU. And I, I was wondering, are there multiple populations or are there two populations? What, what's the structure of the ESU there? Okay, so yeah, that's a great question. Sorry, I didn't make that clear. Those are two separate ESUs. They're shown in the map in, in a green color and a blue color. And within those ESUs are watersheds, which are labeled there. And typically, those watersheds each contain their own population of Chinook salmon that are genetically different slightly from the ones around it. They typically are more different from ones that are further away. Uh, but within an ESU, they're more similar than they are to the ones in, in the adjacent ESU. So there's a, a lot of complexity to the structure. It's probably very important for their conservation. All right. Thank you. As I was going through, I wanted to make sure there was one or two ESUs. Yes. That was. Sorry for that. Continue. All right. If there's no further questions on the status review, then move on to the next one. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to let the council know about what the science centers are doing with Salmon Inflation Reduction Act funding. So uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, you may recall, was a, a big law passed in 2022. I think towards the end of the year, it's, it's the Biden administration's, really their climate act, uh, a very big law full of many, many things. But it does include $349 million that are coming to the NOAA Fisheries Service to um, basically create climate-ready fisheries. And within that, there's $27 million that were directed to the West Coast Science Centers. And Congress did provide very clear direction on what we were to do with that. And just to paraphrase that, it was to support transformative modeling and science to identify and prioritize restoration and reintroduction strategies uh, to create climate resilient ecosystem function and salmon abundance improvements. So that's a, a big ask, you know, we've been working on salmon conservation and recovery uh, formally under the ESA for over 25 years now. Billions of dollars have been spent. We have prevented the extinction probably that would have occurred of, of uh, at least some populations of salmon. But there's a certain level of impatience and frustration with the pace of, of recovery. The centers have, have recognized that and luckily we're in a good position to take on this charge because we have recently completed strategic uh, plans that identify where we need to be focusing our efforts. And um, unfortunately, the, the file in the um, brief and book supplemental doesn't have the links to that plan, but we're gonna get that changed out so that you'll be able to get to those reports easily, those plans more easily. Uh, the centers did conduct their strategic planning largely independently, but we did come to very similar conclusions <laughs> about what the important research themes should be going forward. And uh, working together, we basically distilled those down into four common themes that I wanna tell you a little bit about now. And this is where we're gonna be investing this Inflation Recovery Act money. 
Um, so one of the themes has to do with restoration, reintroduction, and recovery techniques. One of the impediments to recovery is a lack of quality or quantitative understanding of what you get for certain kinds of restoration actions, uh, habitat restoration or moving salmon past dams, um, et cetera, that, that we really need to fill in some gaps. And something that um, wasn't really dealt with too intensively in the recovery plans that all of these listed ESUs do have, which include long lists of prioritized recovery actions, was how those might be shifted under changing climate, which we're increasingly appreciating is not a problem of the distant future, but it's already happening. So one of the themes here is, or, or questions within this theme, is how will climate change and restoration affect the future distribution of salmon habitat? It may be that we need to be focusing on uh, different areas than we thought would be important because of future climate conditions. And if those aren't the habitats that are already available to salmon, how will we get them there? Will we need to uh, remove dams or create passage past dams or, or actively translocate individuals? And then we need to know how salmon or if salmon can adapt to these future conditions. So we have um, some studies that are in development to address those questions in that theme. Another theme is habitat stressors in freshwater and estuary environments. And this was really, um, I think, inspired largely by the recent discovery of what it, exactly it is in tires that is running off into urban watersheds and affecting coho salmon in particular, and a recognition that it, there could be contaminants that people are producing and will be producing more of in the future as populations grow that we need to account for as we think about where we're gonna restore habitat. We could spend a lot of money restoring a watershed that may become polluted by some toxic chemical that we don't really understand. And that would be a, a bad investment if we don't mitigate for that properly. Um, this work is also gonna continue digging into the thiamine deficiency problem that I've told you about uh, in past briefings. Another area that we're very excited to invest in because we often don't get our um, co-managing agencies to get very interested in is ocean and nearshore ecology. Um, I think you all are well aware of the importance of salmon climate connections and how important things are that happen in the ocean uh, for affecting salmon. And we still have a lot of questions there that we think we can make some progress on, such as what is driving variation in marine survival of salmon? We're getting increasing insights that predation is a major factor in that. Um, we're trying to get that nailed down better. How will rising temperatures and increasing hypoxia affect the distribution of salmon in the future? And uh, how are changing ocean conditions altering the catchability of salmon? And can we improve ocean abundance and catch forecasts? I'm sure this group is uh, very interested in progress in that area. And then finally, those three themes are really filling in information gaps to support the kind of overarching theme or goal of this work, which we think is going to be the part that is transformative, which is the development of more integrated models like the ones that we've developed for winter run Chinook salmon to look at questions of water management in California or Chinook salmon in the Columbia River. Um, we want to broaden these to other ESUs and populations and other kinds of uh, impacts and management levers that might be in play so that we can provide tools that will really be able to help managers understand the trade-offs between the many goals we have for salmon and <laughs> the ecosystems in which they live. And it will allow us to answer questions such as what sets of recovery actions can lead to salmon recovery. We have large menus of things that we might do or are encouraging people to do, but we don't know really which ones are necessary or sufficient to achieve recovery. And that uncertainty, I think, leads to a certain kind of gridlock and related to that, what of those actions are most cost effective and socially feasible? And for a given level of investment, how much recovery can we expect to achieve and how long will that take? And then, as I mentioned, I'm especially interested in the nature of the trade-offs among our many goals for salmon and their ecosystem components that they interact with, like marine mammals, water supply, fishing, hatcheries, hydropower, and other considerations. And my main goal for telling you about all of this is that the development of these models to be successful really de depends heavily on engagement with interested parties, such as people involved in the fisheries management process in the development of model capabilities, their application and their interpretation. And as we develop these models and their applications, we're really looking for input from 
everyone who's interested in it, and I hope some of you will be, uh, and other members of the council family. And if this is striking a chord with you at all, please uh, just reach out to me, or we can have a discussion here about how exactly to make that connection. But I, that's my main goal is to start creating the connection so that we can get um, the council involved in this along with other people as well. So just to give a little example of, of how this is actually working, I want to tell you about another project that's not Inflation Reduction Act funded. It would have been had we not received funding from the UC Regents, but it's for a project called Co-Equal. Um, it's the Collaboratory for Equity and Water Allocation. This is a $10 million two-year award that's um, been made to multiple UC campuses. The lead PI is at UC Berkeley. And Co-Equal is trying to develop a publicly accessible view into California's water management system. The core of that is described by a model called CalSim2. It's a very, very complicated operations research model. Generally, it's operated by civil engineers. I don't really know anyone else other than civil engineers that can operate this model. Most of them work for the Bureau of Reclamation or California Department of Water Resources or some very high priced consultancies. Um, and often we only see outputs of, of um, Calcium two or three in terms of a few scenarios that might represent current conditions and proposed alterations, such as um, the addition of the site's reservoir in the Sacramento River or something like that. And this is the model that basically says, given hydrological conditions and inputs to the basin, where does all the water go given the operating rules that are there? Uh, and some of the end users of that are, are, the, are fish or wildlife as well. So Coequal is trying to create a giant library of scenarios that could be easily perused by the interested public to understand really how California water gets allocated and how it could be allocated differently under a changing climate. Um, it is going to be used in four different case studies, which include a, a Delta salinity management, drinking water access for disadvantaged communities, and a uh, the influence on winter run shrimp salmon recovery. And that's the involvement we have. We've developed a model that can take these outputs and translate them into outcomes for winter run shrimp. And there is an opportunity now to get involved in this project. It does have stakeholder or interested party engagement uh, in the form of some advisory committees. And if, if you would like to learn more about that, you can just ask me and I can connect you uh, with the project PIs on this. Um, and that would be a great way to get a head start on what we're trying to do more broadly. So with that, I can take any questions. Thank you. Questions for Dr. Lindley on that part of the report. Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Dr. Lindley. Um, um, you. I think I heard you reference uh, looking at the uh, potential effects of predation. And I wondered if you could just expand a little bit more on what types of, of science activities are being considered to examine that issue. Sure. Uh, and Corey Green is here at the, from the Northwest Center. That, um, it, it is an interesting uh, there, we have, we're doing a little bit different things in the Northwest and the Southwest Center, and I'll try to characterize what the Northwest Center is doing here because they're doing the most around predation. So they are looking at bird and marine mammal predation. They're doing a lot of field work or planning to do field work using different kinds of tagging techniques and other predation uh, observation techniques to understand really how much of an issue bird and seal predation is. I don't know, Corey, if you have anything more to add to that we get into the details but that's pretty much it. okay yeah these these are still in the planning process just Phil? a quick follow-up and is that work primarily planned uh, um in in river or is it also in river and in the ocean the ocean and the estuary yeah not in, not in the river okay yeah it's marine predation okay thank you Thanks. Further questions for Dr. Lynn Lee. Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Dr. Lynn Lee. I'm looking at the supplemental NIMS report uh, PowerPoint and the information that is, I believe, on the top of page. 
before, um, the IRA funds looks like 10.8 million to the Southwest Center. And then if I look on page 11, I'm looking at the staffing proposal. I'm seeing that the Northwest Center is hiring nine uh, FTEs. And then I'm seeing that the only hiring going on in the South appears to be UCSC hiring. And I was just wondering um, why the Southwest Center doesn't appear to be augmenting its full-time staff. So we do have different kind of business models of how we operate our science centers. At the Southwest Center, we rely heavily on the Cooperative Institute uh, that includes most UC campuses. So if you come to our laboratory in Santa Cruz, the majority of employees there are actually UC Santa Cruz employees. So if we're hiring term people, we use the university to do that. The Northwest Fisheries Science Center has historically made much less use of cooperative institutes, and they are using term hires through NOAA. There's advantages and disadvantages to those approaches, and they really reflect somewhat the history of how we deal with temporary funding and the overall finances of our two different centers, which are a little different. Thanks. Further questions, Marcy? Yeah, a second question. Um, <clears throat> if you hang around later in the week and get into some of the discussions that we'll be having later on um, salmon management, um, one new constraint that is just coming to light in uh, this process is the um, result that uh, comes out of the um, new biological opinion on Sonk Coho. Um, this is now going to become a very major constraint uh, in California and Oregon ocean fisheries uh, and involves freshwater fisheries as well. Um, as we're getting new information on exploitations that go on elsewhere, um, it's becoming very clear how important it is going to be to um, prioritize new science that might better inform the information that's in the new biop. Um, can you tell me how um, that work is being addressed uh, with this augmentation of IRA funds? How, how, is, how is the Southwest Center um, considering that priority um, in the mix of new funding? So I think to date, we've, we've not really considered that specific issue, but if that is something that's important, those are the kinds of things we're hoping to learn from other people, what the highest priorities are for them so that we can figure out how to overall address the highest priorities. So thank you for alerting me to that concern and I'll take that up with my team. Thank you. Thanks, Danny Evanson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you, Dr. Lindley, for the presentation. Uh, like Mr. Anderson, uh, I was particularly pleased to see the ocean and nearshore ecology focus. Uh, there has been more and more need for getting juvenile salmon studies in the near shore. And we have noted increasing concern for proliferation of predators, particularly pinnipeds in Alaska that also extends to humpback whales, salmon sharks, and avian predators. And we also recognize that the protections in place for these things, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Migratory Bird Act, are blanket. And so there's not much we can do about it, but it's a big step to get start quantifying them. I'm looking at your funding, which is 7 million, and uh, it's heavy in FY23 and FY24 and then tapers off. And I'm wondering if, you know, is this so these types of studies are incredibly expensive and complicated to engineer. And I'm wondering if that's sufficient to get quality data. Yeah, that's a, those are insightful uh, questions and comments for sure. The funding profiles are a little bit tricky and it gets to do with the different way the two centers do business. So we're going to spend at the Southwest Center most of our money this year because we're making a grant to the University of California. 
And this is one of the possible advantages of going that way is the grants have a five-year term. The Inflation Reduction Act money expires at the end of FY26. So we, we need to have the money spent by then, if not earlier. Uh, in a grant, it can carry on until the grant is completed once the money is obligated. So these are time intensive studies. Science, it's hard to get anything really new done in five years from a research project perspective. This is one of the overall challenges with the Inflation Reduction Act scenario is that we're given a, a bolus of, of money and, and a very short window to spend it and, and get some transformative results. That did influence our, our thinking of what can we realistically get done on a very short turnaround. Um, so I wouldn't read too much into the funding profile, um, and we're, we're very aware of the, the ticking clock on all of this, so trying to get things done as quickly as we can that they're going to yield some results is at the forefront of our minds. Uh, we could definitely, if we had more money, we, we could have found very good things to do with it. We had to make a lot of hard cuts to come up with about two dozen projects that we're contemplating. That's from the list of about 80 that we started with. Thanks for that response. Um, just a quick follow up, and I apologize if I missed it. Is most of the predation work in California, or that, that's a lot of that's not enough money to to get good estimates? Because why we have a big coastline, so um, it's the, the field work on predation funded by IRA is mostly in the Pacific Northwest. In California, our marine salmon work is more going to be focused on synthesis and integration of existing data sets. We, we think we already know a fair bit about what the issue is in, in predation for Central Valley stocks. It really does seem to be largely explained by birds. And uh, they don't have that understanding uh, for the Columbia River or Puget Sound, for example, as much. Thank you for that. We have received a lot of public comment around this table, particularly from uh, tribal co-managers and expressing concerns about pinniped predation. And I certainly hear it at every port meeting I go to. So appreciate the work. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Mark Grelnick. Thank you, Vice Chair Hesmer, and thank you, Dr. Lindley. You made a comment earlier about Central Valley predation being predominantly by birds. Um, I think that in the common lore in the community, it's believed to be striped bass. So can you expand on that a bit? Yes, thank you for that clarifying question. Uh, my comment about birds is about in the marine environment, where it seems to be the, the seabirds on the Farallon Islands, they're right there in the middle of the, the nursery grounds for, for salmon. But Central Valley salmon during their river and estuary migration suffer very heavy predation. Um, and we have done studies, a lot of studies there that show that striped bass are a major player in that in inland waters, uh, but also largemouth bass, which is a proliferating um, species that seems to be responding to the change of the delta into, into a lake functionally. Um, and there are other, other fish as well. Catfish seem to be somewhat of an issue as well. So it does change the, the, the different mouths as you move along the system, but the, the birds are off the coast. Thanks. Corey Ridings. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Dr. Lindley. Um, and thanks for uh, presenting to us about co-equal. This was really interesting to learn about. Um, I'm trying to get my head a little, little bit more about the goals and products that are going to come out of that. Can you share a little bit more with us about that? So, uh, yeah, there's probably a, a lot of things that I am not really prepared to speak to. It, it's a very large project. It, it, salmon is just one, one part of it. Uh, so I'll speak to that primarily. The, the goal is basically to find out what the limits are for the system to support one of the things to find out is just what could be done for salmon with water management if if that was your primary concern was to allocate water to benefit salmon what could you achieve and what would be the cost to other water users in the system that's really what we're, we're trying to get at and is i'm especially interested in whether the kinds of of management scenarios that are under consideration are efficient in the terms of providing without foregoing benefits to either to the users of water or or salmon. We really don't know the answer to that question. Ideally, we'd be selecting uh, management options that are on this efficiency frontier. And we hope to, to be able to allow people to do that. 
Thanks for that. I um, just wanted to know, as, as that project moves forward, it'd be great for you to keep bringing this forward to the council, okay. um, just so us and the entire sort of council family can be kept engaged and, and we can hopefully make sure that um, fisheries are strongly on the radar for that project. I will I will do that. Just reiterate my invitation to anybody who would like to get directly involved in this to, to please let me know. Thank you. Look around and see. Susan Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Dr. Lindley, um, you have um, extended an invitation to the council to be uh, come involved and provide input into these various projects. Is there specific types of expertise that would be most valuable or information that you are seeking that would be most helpful from the council membership? I think I would really like to capture the diversity of, of interest that, that people might have that are coming at it from a, a fishing from angle. We're going to be looking at Presumably, it, it possible changes in in harvest strategies or hatchery management strategies amongst all of these other kinds of resource strategies. So people that could understand what might be of interest or what might be feasible or what might not be feasible to, to consider there would be extremely valuable. Thanks. Look around and see if there's any further Questions for Dr. Lindley? I don't see any hands. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for your interest. I really enjoyed speaking with you this morning. Thanks. That will take us to public comment. And I know we have at least one sign up. We'll pause while that screen appears before us. John McManus is remote. John, can you hear us? Is John online here? John, we can't hear you. I'm not seeing him on mine, but. Yeah, John, you're unmuted. Uh, can you hear us? Uh, John. If you can hear us, uh, you might need to unmute your device on your end. You are unmuted on our end. Um, <coughs> let's pause just for a minute here and see if he comes up. We've got plenty of time. Mark Grelnick. Uh, I just received a text message from Mr. McManus he indicating he's having trouble and he'll take this up under E2. Thank you very much. So that will complete our public comment and take us into council discussion and action. Uh, our action is uh, simply discussion on this item. So I will look around and see if there anybody wants to initiate discussion and I'm not seeing any hands Marcy Remco yeah um thank you Mr. Rice or Mr. Chair apologies um Vice Chair apologies Brad <laughs> <laughs> um want to thank Dr. Lindley for being here with us and want to um 
express uh, that I understand what he's talking about um, in terms of needing to administer uh, um, a bunch, a lot of money um, and spend it quickly under a deadline and the challenges that um, that creates and the need to prioritize projects and pick between um, a good number of what might be very um, worthy research endeavors. Um, I guess I would just say that um, $10.8 million for the Southwest Center seems like a lot of money. Um, and I would hope that, um, I mean, we have, we spend a lot of time on research and data needs in our discussions. Um, our stock assessors take great care, um, to spend the time to articulate how our assessments can be better and what information, um, would help them, um, improve into the future. And then, with regard to salmon modeling, we spend quite a bit of time each year um, developing a list of methods review items um, outside of the research and data needs questions. And I know oftentimes um, year over year, um, there's just more on the list that can be accomplished in the timeline that we establish under methods reviews. So I guess I'm just um, hoping to see um, I, I I understand that um, this is this is the look that we have about how the um, the science centers intend to spend um, the IRA funds, but I I would look forward into the future to see um, what deliverables actually um, are realized that contribute to our council management discussions and our our scientific pursuits. Um, they're just you know they're they're are some good concepts here, but I guess I'm looking for some, you know, con more concrete um, information in the, into the future. But I appreciate the, the chance to discuss here today. And thank you for bringing this to us. Thank you, Marcy. Further discussion? I'm not seeing any hands, so I will turn to Robin see how we've done here. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, your work under this ag agenda item is complete. We've had a good discussion on some of the salmon topics and research going on. And um, so, yes, you've completed your work. Thank you. All right. Thank you. That completes agenda item E1. Um, we are moving so fast that we are not prepared to take up agenda item E2 until one o'clock after lunch. Is that correct? Yes. Yep, so apologize for giving you a longer lunch, but we will see you back here at 1 p.m. Thanks.
All right, 45 second warning. We're going to start here very shortly. All right. Thanks, everyone. Hope you had a good lunch and are fully energized for this afternoon. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Robin Elke for an introduction to this agenda item. Robin. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, before we get into E2, I just wanted to give the council an update on the halibut. Uh, topic. There was a request for uh, halibut information, the number of salmon uh, permits uh, issued for 2024. I have that information, uh, 110 permits, 110 for uh, salmon in 2024. And excuse me, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure if we actually closed out D1. Uh, yeah, we did. We closed out our salmon stuff too. Okay. Thank you. So ready for E2, here we go. Uh, so this is the tentative adoption of the 2024 management measures uh, for analysis. Um, it's a, a good size uh, agenda item. There's gonna be a lot of information here under this, but um, if you recall back in March, the council adopted three salmon management alternatives and we published those in pre-season report two and we sent them out for public review. The summaries of the testimonies heard at the public meetings will also be provided under this agenda item. <clears throat> uh, the council is also scare, scheduled to narrow down the management alternatives to a single alternative for analysis by the STT to allow adequate analysis before final adoption. The tentatively adopted recommendations should resolve any outstanding conflicts, conflicts and be used as close as possible to the final management measures. Any agreements by outside parties to be incorporated into the council's management recommendations must be presented to the council prior to adoption of the tentative options. Procedure also stipulates that new alternatives or analysis must be reviewed by the STT and the public prior to the council's final adoption. Management measures considered for adoption that deviate from this Salmon fishery management plan objectives will require implementation by emergency rule. If an emergency rule appears to be necessary, then the council must clearly identify and justify the need for such an action consistent with the criteria established by the council, which is provided in attachment one and by NIMPS, which is provided in attachment two. The STT will check back with the council on Sunday, April 7th under agenda item E2 and clarify any questions or obvious problems with the tentative measures. So your action under this agenda item is to adopt the 2024 ocean salmon management measures for analysis. You have a lot of reference material under this agenda item. Um, we have attachments one and two, which are uh, giving you information on any um, emergency changes that may be deemed necessary and what the protocol for that might be. Um, we did publish a preseason report too that has the three uh, alternatives that were adopted for public review in March. We have under agenda uh, section A, E2A, the STT supplemental report, which was going to give you an idea of what changes have occurred since we last met in March. And we have three reports from the uh, salmon public hearings that, in, that occurred um, after the March meeting. Under agenda E2E, we have the SAS supplemental report with their proposed seasons uh, for, uh, the, for tentative adoption. Uh, in addition, we do have um, some reports from uh, the uh, PSC, we have some information there for the council. 
And we also have um, some uh, tribal reports, a number of tribal reports, and I'm sure uh, some public comment as well. So with that, Mr. Chair, that uh, sums up uh, agenda item E2. Thank you. Before we proceed, are there any questions on the overview for this agenda item? Not seeing any questions then, we'll move directly into the reports. The first one will be the Salmon Technical Team Report. Dr. Michael O'Farrell is here for that. Good afternoon, Dr. O'Farrell. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. I will be referring to Agenda Item E2A, uh, Salmon Technical Team Report on Estimated uh, Impacts of March 2024 Alternatives for Ocean Fishery Management Measures. Um, in this report, um, the STT has received new information um, on uh, northern fishery inputs, uh, abundance forecasts, and initial uh, uh, updates for Puget Sound stocks. And I'll um, go through and hit the highlights um, of um, the analysis um, giving these uh, changes. On page one, um, there are a number of um, bolded values uh, for Puget Sound stocks. Um, and uh, we just acknowledge uh, that, the, uh, that the North of Falcon process is ongoing and um, that will be um, part of the work of uh, this week. Moving on to uh, the next page, um, uh, the Washington Coast and Columbia River stocks uh, meet their objectives. This is for Chinook. Um, moving on, um, there's no changes in um, for the Oregon Coast and California Chinook stocks um, that are uh, notable at this time. Continuing on, um, we get to the coho um, section um, the, for the uh, some of the Puget Sound stocks, um, uh, Quileute Fall on the coast and uh, Lower Columbia River Natural. Um, there are exploitation rates that um, exceed the limit um, in some cases. Um, also, um, with regard to Southern Oregon, Northern California Coast Coho, at the bottom of the table, um, we have two um, alternatives, one and two for um, the Trinity natural component um, exceed uh, the 16% maximum exploitation rate. That concludes um, the overview of table five. Um, table seven um, has a breakdown of um, exploitation rates for LCN coho, OCN coho, and uh, lower Columbia River tules. And um, when th there is one case here uh, for LCN coho where uh, the uh, total exploitation rate is, uh, or not the total exploitation rate, but the exploitation rate um, in the ocean is 17% uh, and thus is pulled. And on the last page of this report, um, we have a breakdown of the, the um, uh, imp impact rates for uh, song coho, the different components of song coho. And again, at the bottom, um, under on alternatives one and two, uh, the total exploitation rate exceeds uh, the 16%. Those, th thus, those values are uh, bolded. And that concludes my overview of the updates since the March council meeting. And I can try to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions for Dr. O'Farrell on the STT report? Doesn't appear to be any questions. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Next, we'll move on to, as soon as I, my computer responds here, the summary of the public hearings. We'll start in the north with Washington, Kyle Addix. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, there was a public hearing focused on Washington State salmon, manage all, salmon management alternatives held in Westport, Washington on the evening of Monday, March 25th. 
um, representatives on hand at the table at the front of the room included myself as the hearing officer, uh, Mr. Phil Anderson from National Marine Fisheries Service, Mr. Tony Sinisco. I have to apologize, we missed updating a name um, for the United, United States Coast Guard Lieutenant Junior Grade Sam Santiago was in um, in attendance. Apologies to Lieutenant Santiago for not updating that, but appreciate him making the trip out to Westport. For the council staff, Executive Director Burden was there. And for the Salmon Technical Team, Dr. Alex Safik. Um, council member Butch Smith was also present in the audience, but it was a small table. There wasn't room for everybody at the front of the room, but he was there with us. Um, I provided some opening remarks on just the general state of the forecast and outlook for this year. Um, Dr. Safik reviewed the alternatives for commercial and recreational salmon seasons in detail. We had a total of 22 participants who provided comment, 10 representing commercial fisheries and 12 representing sport interest. The overlying theme of public testimony was a preference for alternative one for both commercial and recreational fisheries. There was also a lot of appreciation expressed for the hearing location and format having an in-person meeting in the town of Westport. For commercial testimony, the president of the Washington Trollers Association provided comment on com the commercial troll fishery. They supported the non-treaty quotas and season structure from Alternative 1, including measures for incidental Pacific halibut catch represented by Alternative 1. They noted the relatively large Lower Columbia Thule forecast for 2024, as well as run sizes and conservation objectives that are being met for Columbia River and Puget Sound Chinook stocks. They referenced the projected increase in ex vessel revenue of Alternative 1 compared to the 2018 to 2022 average and cited the benefit this would have to coastal communities and businesses. They contrasted this year's projections with the constraints that have been placed on North of Falcon Ocean fisheries in recent years and the impact this has had to the, to the fleet and local businesses. They supported a Chinook quota of 85,000, a coho total allowable catch of 105,000, and support the utilization of in-season <laughs> tools to provide flexibility to attain the full quota. They also expressed concern about the negative economic impact of recent decreases in quota, but are encouraged by this year's forecast. Nine other individuals testifying on commercial fisheries supported the um, testimony by the WTA president. For recreational testimony, we had 12 people provide comment, including representatives and members of the Westport Charter Boat Association and Puget Sound Anglers. Similar to the commercial testimony, Alternative 1 was favored. The representative of PSA supported Alternative 1 and a season structure that will provide maximum opportunity. The president of the West Boat Charter, Westport Charter Boat Association supported Alternative 1, but with the season structure for the Westport sub area that includes five day per week openings on Sundays through Thursdays for the first three weeks of the season, then switching to seven days per week beginning July 21st. There was wide, widespread support for a season structure that would avoid an early closure, and several individuals noted the negative economic impl implications of closing the season before September. Several individuals supported the West, Westport Charter Boat Association testimony and regulations that would begin the season with a five day per week openings before moving to seven days per week in order, in order to provide for a season that does last into September. Testimony also included a preference for avoiding restrictive in-season adjustments if possible, preference for a two fish bag limit with one Chinook, and for providing as much advanced notice as possible for all in-season adjustments due to effect on customers. Um, I provided some closing remarks, reminded everyone of the um, online written comment um, capability as well as the chance to participate this week here in Seattle and reminded them of the, the other meetings going on in our North of Falcon forum um, through the rest of March. Um, thanks to Executive, Executive Director Burden for making the trip out. I think you saw how important it was to the community that we have that meeting out there and, and have some face-to-face -face time with the constituents. Thank you, Kyle. Any questions for Mr. Addix on the report on the Washington hearings? Seeing none, I'll look to Oregon, Mr. John North. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, we had our salmon public hearing on March 26th to review the alternatives, and this year it was held online only, kind of just test that to see if it would increase participation. Uh, I was present as a council rep along uh, and along with me was Mr. Tony Sinisco of National Marine Fisheries Service, uh, Lieutenant uh, J.G. Sam Santiago with the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, Ms. Robin Elke with council staff and Ms. Cassie Lehman from the Salmon Technical Team. We had about 30 folks sign up, including um, Chair Pettinger, who was uh, 
uh, Long and also several of our um, Salmon Advisory sub-panel folks uh, were present. I provided some opening remarks and background and, uh, and Mr. Richard Heap provided some comments on the season modeling and constraints and Ms. Lehman went through all of the uh, commercial and recreational alternatives. Overall, I think it was a good meeting, although we did have uh, some technical difficulties that resulted in some folks who signed on not being able to testify. I think it had something to do with uh, using a cell phone and uh, we'll have to work on that. So we, we didn't really get to hear from everybody, but we did have six people who testified, three commercial, three recreational. Uh, the commercial testimony for the Cape Fum Cape Falcon to Humbug area uh, supported alternative one. There was a request for some additional days in August and to increase the coho trip limit under alternative three since the Oregon troll fleet has diminished in fishing power over, over time. Uh, recreational testimony all supported alternative one for all of the management areas. Uh, there was a request to consider Mark Selective Chinook fishing in August if needed. There were some suggested tweaks to the dates for the Coho Mark Selective fishery. And then uh, there was some comment on that any commercial Coho opportunity needed to be contingent on um, sport, sport sport priority um, prior to any commercial coho opportunity. And then uh, there was also a, a request for additional clarity on the Sacramento Falls Chinook in river allocations. Um, we did ask uh, everybody that joined the call for their input on what they thought of a virtual meeting versus in person. Uh, the comments were mixed, uh, several, several folks you know, in like the ease uh, and the not needing to travel for the hearing, but others also recognize the benefit of face-to-face. -face. Um, I think overall they suggested maybe mixing it up, you know, um, you don't have to go all one way or another, but maybe having face-to-face -face every, every other year or every once out of every three years, something like that. But um, that's my report. Thank you, John. Any questions on the Oregon report? Not seeing any, we'll move to California. Mr. Mark Gorelnik will deliver that. Mark. All right, thank you very much, Vice Chair Hassamer. Um, the public hearing uh, focused on salmon and management alternatives affecting California was held in Santa Rosa, California on the evening of Monday, March 25th, 2024. Representatives on hand included, aside from myself, Ms. Shannon Penna, Ms. Robin Elke for council staff, and Ms. Candace Morgenstern from the Salmon Technical Team. We had an estimated 65 participants at the meeting. It was a very well attended meeting. Um, and aside from those names I've mentioned, uh, California council members, Bob Dooley and Corey Ridings attended as well as uh, uh, from the Salmon Advisory Subpanel, we had George, we had uh, Johnny, and we had Jim. Um, we had us had, also had multiple agency staff from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. I provided opening remarks. Uh, Ms. Candace Morgenstern provided a PowerPoint presentation summarizing the salmon forecasts, conservation objectives, and estimated impacts based on the alternatives, including those in Oregon and coastal waters. And Ms. Morgenstern also answered a series of challenging questions from those in attendance. Um, we had a total of 25 folks offered public testimony. Uh, the majority were from the recreational sector representing charter vessels. We had a very good turnout from the Golden Gate Fishing Fishermen's Association. Um, testimony was mixed. And it was either uh, mainly either support for a closure alternative three from the charter operators or support from alternative one from the anglers in attendance. Uh, commercial testimony, we had six uh, members of the public signed up representing uh, commercial troll interests and all supported alternative three. And there was also consider a support for a quota system for each vessel so that vessel operators can fish when they have a market and when the weather is safe to fish. 
as opposed to a fixed dates. Um, on the recreational side, uh, 19 members uh, of the public signed up to testify, as mentioned, um, a majority from uh, the charter sector. Uh, the uh, anglers in attendance, six supported alternative one, one supported alternative two, and the charter sector was unanimous in supporting alternative three. Um, as I said, uh, reading from the report here, uh, as I said, most anglers supported alternative one, stating that allowing for a sports season, even if small, would help the economy and, smor and support small businesses. Um, and there were some anglers that supported a closure and support for alternative two was voiced from one private angler. The charter operators asked that if a troll fishery was closed again this year, that the troll apportioned fish should be allowed to escape to the spawning grounds and not used for harvest. There was a suggestion of a 24 inch size limit to allow more jacks to escape. There was comment that the sport quotas were too small and the open time period is too short and catch a lot of salmon in a compressed time period. There was uncertainty about how in season management would work and there was also sentiment that if we want a sustainable fishery for years to come, a full closure is preferred rather than risk exceeding the quotas. And another comment was there were just not enough fish to support the fishery. Best to stay closed for another year and rebuild the stock. Um, there were um, other comments talking about poor ma uh, alleged poor hatchery management and water management strategies that are affecting the salmon and the habitat. Um, again, there was a comment about the alternatives not being economically viable. Uh, water is the problem, and then we're fighting over scraps. Uh, one person suggested a tribal ocean test fishery of about 600 fish of the tribal allocation to be caught in marine waters. And the organizations in attendance, uh, the Bodega Bay Fishermen's Marketing Association, Coastside Fishing Club, Golden Gate Fishermen's Association, Golden State Salmon Association, Fort Bragg Trollers Association, NorCal Aluminum Boats, North Coast Rivers Alliance, the Port of Bodega Bay, and a salmon buyer from Simply Wild. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Gorelnik on that report? I don't see any, thank you very much. Next, we will have a report from the U.S. Section of the Pacific Salmon Commission, Mr. Phil Anderson. Phil. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I'm going to have two pieces to my report. Um, one will deal with a um, memo to the Pacific Salmon Commission from our Chinook Technical Committee. It is in the briefing material under agenda item E2C, and I'll also be um, reporting on a memo from the Chinook Technical Committee that the Chinook Interface Group received yesterday uh, relative to the performance um, indicators on uh, some of the key escapement and uh, key escapement indicator stocks. Um, so first, turning to the memo that's in your book, and I referenced um, in my report in March uh, that as, as usual, we, we could expect this report. And as you know, it's an important piece of work because it serves to update the northern inputs to our model to fully assess the impacts of our regulations on the various stocks that we have uh, management objectives for. Um, the Chinook Technical Committee did provide the commission the results of their completed calibration of calibration 2403, uh, which utilizes the Chinook model for 2024. The calibration provides 2024 preseason abundance indices for determining the annual catch limits for the Southeast Alaska, that is between Cape Suckling to Dixon entrance, sport, net and troll fisheries. The Northern British Columbia troll and Haida Gwaii sport fishery, which we refer to as the NBC, and the West Coast of Vancouver Island troll and outside sport 
fisheries. All three of these areas are managed under um, what we refer to as an aggregate abundance-based management system. This calibration also provides the, uh, in addition to the abundance indices, it pro provides for the annual catch limits uh, for each one of these areas. On the second page of that memo, uh, under table A, uh, you, will ref you will see the results of the uh, calibration and the corresponding annual catch limits. For Southeast Alaska, the annual catch limit will be 211,400. Uh, as a reference point, last year it was 206,027. Uh, for Northern British Columbia, it's 179,400, up from 141,700 last year. And for the west coast of Vancouver Island, it, the uh, annual catch limit will be 105,000 compared to 115,500 from last year. You'll also see some information in table B and associated with what we call the multivariant model. It's a, it's a model that uh, showed a lot of promise uh, during the development of, of that model, uh, particularly with our CTC and, and the state of Alaska's work. Uh, we're running that model side by side here for a period of time to compare its performance against the performance of our um, uh, Chinook model that is used by the CTC. So I'll pause there and ask if there's any questions. So at the end of my report, I'll also ask my colleagues from around the table if they have any remarks. But before I do that, I wanted to pause here and then go to the second report that I referenced. Thank you. Let's take a pause and I'll look around, see if there are any questions for Mr. Anderson on the first part of the report. And I see no questions, so please go ahead and fill. Thank you. So as part of our uh, work to evaluate the effectiveness of our management measures, um, we have a, we have a, um, system in place where the Chinook Technical Committee uh, looks at and tracks our uh, escapements for our indicator stocks and the exploitation rate that are associated with, with those stocks. Um, there are certain requirements for a variety of those, for, for all of those indicator stocks that both originate in Canada as well as the US. Um, and we recently um, uh, had an update uh, on those. We're in we're in a uh, three year review cycle for for those stocks. And um, coming out of our um, winter meetings that occurred in January and February, our Chinook Interface Group, which is a small bilateral uh, group that's charged with um interacting between the commission and our chinook technical committee made a request of the chinook technical committee to update the uh, individual uh, stock-based management fishery performance tables that were provided to us in a summary report the reason that we wanted that to be updated was we noted that there needed to be some corrections made to the non-retention files that were used in that in the computations to ascertain the level of the exploit the calendar year exploitation rates that are used to judge whether or not we're meeting our management objectives that are called for in the treaty. I just um, received uh, yesterday the, uh, re the report along with my, my other colleagues uh, from the Chinook Technical Committee. Uh, and one of the outcomes, there were a number of outcomes, I'm not gonna to go through all of them, but one in particular that raises a, a concern for the United States is the overage that um, we see relative to Snohomish Chinook. 
And uh, as part of our discussion uh, in, at our February meeting of the Pacific Salmon Commission and in our meeting of the Chinook Interface Group, we noted the expectation of the receipt of this report at approximately this time and uh, the likelihood that in the event that there were overages of the limits associated with the calendar year exploitation rates that are specified in the treaty, that there may be a need uh, to have a, a um, out of cycle meeting with Canada uh, to address those. Um, so again, in we just received this yesterday, but in a, as in as I said, a particular concern <laughs> is the overage in the Canadian fisheries relative to their obligations to the calendar year exploitation rate limits associated with the Snohomish. And so uh, there will be some additional. Um, I've already had a a um, outreach and this outreach to my um, colleague in Canada. I, I serve as chair of the U.S. section. Uh, Andy Thompson serves as chair of the Canadian section. I've had a preliminary discussion with him, uh, and I would anticipate that we will have um, additional discussions within the U.S. section and the potential of a bilateral discussion uh, to address this particular stock and other stocks of concern that are not in compliance with the provisions of the treaty. Um, so I'll stop there. That concludes um, my report. I do have several colleagues around the table that participate in the Pacific Salmon Commission process. Ms. Evanson, Mr. Oatman, Mr. Addix, um, and uh, they may have something to add to my report. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. I'll look around and see Danny Evanson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you, Mr. Anderson, for that comprehensive report. I just want to note a few things. Um, with respect to the Canadian impacts, what we've been seeing in Canada is that they've gone increasingly to non-retention in their sport fisheries as a management tool to reduce impacts on certain stocks of concern in Canada. And with that, there's been, you're transferring fish from landed catch into incidental mortality. So it makes it a little more difficult to assess those things. That's the challenge we ran into and how those were handled and they've been rerun. Um, but I just want to note that um, there's a time step difference. And so the impacts that we're talking about are through 2021. So it includes 2019, 2020, and 2021. It doesn't mean that it's not concerning still today. And talks will be ongoing uh, to address some of that. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Anything anyone else wants to add? involved in that process. Not seeing any additions. Any other questions for Mr. Anderson or any of the PSC colleagues? Phil. I didn't, I apologize. I didn't see that Ms. Bishop had joined the table. She's also one of my colleagues that participates in the Pacific Salmon Commission process. And Mr. Smith also is on the Southern panel. Sorry about that. All right, thank you. I'm not seeing any further questions on the Pacific Salmon Commission report. So thank you very much for that, Phil. Um, with that, we will move on. And I want to look and see if we have any updates on, <clears throat> excuse me, progress in the North of Cape Falcon process. I'll look to either Mr. Kyle Addix, John Norris, or Joe Oatman. Anything there, Kyle? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, We've been through our normal series of public meetings in Washington as part of the North of Falcon process, as well as a series of co-manager meetings. Um, those meetings continue into this week. Um, as Mr. Anderson mentioned, a key piece of our fishery planning is getting that Northern Chinook information um, that's critical to our modeling. Another key step is 
getting from three alternatives down to a single set of ocean fisheries to analyze. So we'll be continuing to, to meet with the co-managers um, and our public through the week, um, shaping inside fisheries and ocean fisheries to make sure that we meet the, the long list of conservation objectives that we need to meet by the um, middle of next week. Thank you, Kyle. I'll just double check here, either John or Joe, anything additional? No. Thank you. Any questions for those gentlemen on the North of Falcon process? Not seeing any there. I'm going to look to Joe Oatman to see if we've got some tribal reports. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, the first report that we have will be from representative from the Upper Skagit Indian Tribe, uh, Mr. Scott Schuler. I'd like to invite him to the table to provide his report. Good afternoon. Scott, yeah. you need to um, push the button on the mic to turn it on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Scott Schuyler. I'm the policy rep for the Upper Skagit Indian Tribe. And uh, I would like to give the following testimony. Dear members of the Pacific Fisheries Management Council, concerning the planning process for the 2024 fisheries, the Upper Skagit Indian Tribe has significant concerns about planned fishery impacts on the Skagit River origin summer, fall, Chinook salmon. The three populations of the Skagit summer and fall Chinook managed as a single unit are being impacted by both climate-induced and anthropogenic factors. This year's return is much lower than needed to safeguard the viability of the individual populations. We recognize that there is nothing that can be done in the short term to influence the climate-induced factors and some of the anthropogenic factors, but the planned fishery impacts under the purview of the PFMC can be adjusted to better protect these populations of Chinook salmon. Additionally, the PFMC must consider support for a reduction of Canadian fishery impacts on these populations. Currently model an exploitation rate of 17%, which is greater than the exploitation rate of sealing for all Southern US fisheries. The Upper Skagit Indian tribes reminds the PFMC that the minimum escapement for natural sock summer Chinook spawners to the spawning grounds is 400 adults, and that the current model suggests that the escapement will be well below the 350 adult spawners. Based on the established best management practices, biological considerations, and the forecast to re return below the low abundance threshold, the minimum escapement needs for the Sauk Summer Chinook, the Upper Skagit Tribe requests that the PFMC ensure that all pre-terminal fisheries be managed to achieve maximum possible escapement to, uh, to spawning and ensure population viability. It is obvious that there is no way to for the 2024-25 southern U.S. salmon fisheries to be shaped in such a manner that the sock summers escapement will reach the designated low abundance threshold escapement of 400 fish and that the only option will be to focus on achieving the Southern U.S. ER ceiling of 15%. While achieving the Southern U.S. ER may be acceptable for the protection, sorry, for the protection of the U.S.-Canada agreement, it does not protect the recovery and maintenance needs for the Sauk summer Chinook population. The Upper Skagit Tribe respectfully submits that the projected return of wild sock summer Chinook salmon to the Skagit River is far below that necessary to ensure protection of the resource in 2024. Just as the Upper Skagit Tribe must constrain their impacts, including ceremony and subsistence needs, the PFMC must consider weak stock management measures that will reduce the impacts and protect the sock summer Chinook and other wild spawning populations of Chinook salmon this year both for the health of the resource and the associated treaty rights of the Indian tribes of Washington state. In closing, the Upper Skagit Indian tribe reminds the council that the protect projections for the 2025 returns of Skagit Chinook is even more concerning than this year, and that the expectation of, of the tribe that the PFMC will consider that needs of the resource above all else in fisheries planning beyond this year and into the near foreseeable future. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Schuyler on his report? 
And I see no questions. Thank you very much. And Joe. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, for the next travel report, I'd like to invite up the Columbia River Treaty Tribes. Gentlemen, come on up. Good afternoon. Remember, there's the little button there for the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Good day, members of the council. Uh, my name is uh, Wilbur Slotkis, Jr. I am a member of the Yakima Nation and a quit fit commissioner. I am here with Bruce Jim Sr. from Armsprigs and Eric Colt from the Nez Perce Tribe. I'm here to provide a statement on behalf of the four Columbia River Treaty Tribes, the Umatilla, Warm Springs, Yakima, and Nez Perce. Our tribes are composed of numerous brands that were joined together when the treaties were signed and all have federally recognized treaty rights in the Columbia River and its tributaries. From time immemorial, the Columbia Treaty tribes, Treaty tribes have relied on the river and the tributaries for our culture, food, and economy. As the council considers options for the salmon, ocean salmon fisheries this year, we would like to point out that our objective in salmon restoration is to build up salmon runs to healthy, self-sustaining levels, not simply to build up fisheries. We don't need to catch every last fish. The challenges, challenges facing us as we plan our fisheries is because the status of our fish runs have been impacted by a wide range of non-fishing activities, not simply fishing. The habitat in the Columbia Basin has been radically altered, but habitat problems are not the only ones. One major issue that is affecting our salmon and steelheads in avias, is avian predation. Bird populations in the Columbia Basin have grown to levels that are se severely impacting our fish. Birds can eat tens of thousands of small every year, including fish that contribute to council fisheries. This happened because human activities, especially the construction of the hydro system. There are thousands of gulls nesting right now in the areas as Miller Island near the mouth of the Deschutes River. These gulls feed on both at both dams and in shallow silted areas around river mouths where smolts are available and are supported by large nearby landfills during other times of the year. There is no reason to uh, allow gulls to nest in the interior basin in anywhere near the numbers they currently do. We need to take actions to limit these birds' ability to reproduce. White pelicans also have also become problematic. Their populations in the interior Columbia Basin have increased dramatically in recent years, and their impacts on fish has grown as their population increases. Pelicans not only eat smolts, but in but can eat fish at least as large as an adult sockeye. We need to take, take action to limit breeding pelican populations. If birds are a natural part of the ecosystem, but human activities have put the system way out of balance. We need to be able to manage these salmon predators. There are several other bird species that impact salmon. Besides birds, non-native fish are significant, 
significant predators of salmon smolts. We have even seen increases in stellar lions that prey on fall tunic stocks in the Columbia. These are just some examples of the work that we all need to continue to do if we are going to fully recover our salmon populations and be able to support reasonable fisheries. Until, until we can address all of the impacts that are adversely affecting our salmon, we will never reach recovery. We will continue to review the impacts on Columbia River stocks from the fishery op options, and we'll have additional comments later. Thank you, and that is. But I have a, a little personal viewpoint to add when these guys, my fellow tribesmen, have said something. And we'll start with Bruce. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank the mission, you know, for listening to us. Uh, all these years, and hopefully that, you know, it opened your ears to understand uh, what the tribe's role is in all of this and how we play into this. You know, the testimony of the four tribes, the Columbia River Treaty tribes is important because of all the salmon restoration processes that is promised by the U.S. government, that in turn that you guys take care of to see how it is shared and how it's allocated out. That's how important the tribe's role is here. That's how important we are. That's how important the tribes are here in Pacific Coastal. It's because of us that these programs go on because of the promises of the United States government, not only from the Treaty of 1855, but when the dams were built along the Columbia River, that they were going to rebuild the salmon runs and everything. And then in turn, the four tribes turned and start rebuilding the runs themselves on their hatcheries and everything else and whatever they could do for everyone to share, everyone, not just the tribes. So it's really important, like, when you see us coming and our comments and testimonies that we make to you today, that we make to the people, the user groups, the sportsmen, the trollers, the gill netters, uh, guide services, and everything. These all come down to the promises of the, to the tribes, and we're here to see that it's still maintained. And we're here to see that this resource is going to be protected and rebuilt. That's why we speak the way we speak. You know that sometimes it's harsh, sometimes it's stern, and, but a lot of times it's for the resource that we're to care for that uh, has almost been depleted. When we talk about predators, uh, and everything. It's not idle talk. It's something that's protecting, that's not protecting, but that's something that is uh, a big problem with, uh, with us today on the Columbia River. We can't get, seem to get the U.S. Fish and Wildlife or whoever to move to Take care of these birds, take care of these sea lions. Uh, that's a big problem for us to start uh, trying to rebuild uh, the, what you call rebuilding the salmon runs. And hopefully you guys will hear that 
and uh, really try to do some kind of work on that. It's not only in our country, it's also up here in Pacific, uh, the Sound along the coast. Uh, human beings have created that environment for them. But also, we should be able to control them, or at least do something if we're going to try to rebuild these salmon runs uh, the way they used to be and everything. And when we come and talk about these resources and everything else, because we are the closest to it. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eric Holt. I'm chairman of the Nespers Tribe Fish and Wildlife Commission, and glad to be here and honored to uh, offer a few words on behalf of the Nespers. You know, I think about um, um, going back to 1855, my Indian name, Hiyum Tamaluk, means next grizzly bear in line. And my great great grandfather was at the treaty signing. You know, and I think about things that have transpired and have gone on since then, you know, and I think we've all seen the historical drama and drastic decline of everything inclusive to the first foods that we hold dearly. And um, but as I sit here amongst our elders, you know, we're united in our treaty rights in our desire to restore healthy and harvestable levels of salmon, steelhead, and lamprey. And what happens in the Snake and Salmon River basins directly impacts not just us in these basins, but our mainstay Zone 6 treaty fishery. The Snake, Salmon, and Clearwater River basins still have a lot of pristine habitat. And this is the one of the things that I think about, you know, and I don't say this in a bad way, but it, I do. Idaho lowered water quality standards and Idaho has the most pristine habitat left in the lower 48 and we need to protect them. And so we need them to come on with us in understanding the importance of protecting water quality standards and the habitat, because that's what's going away and that's what's declining these salmon runs. So we need a collective approach on that. <laughs> We're restoring habitat where it's needed and we brought additional hatchery production online with our own facilities and shaped hatchery releases, both through USV versus Oregon with our co-management at Dorshack and Kuski. Ocean conditions and predation certainly impact our fisheries, but we keep coming back to the reality that are, there are four concrete barriers on the lower Snake River that are having enormous impact on the fish. And we know that for the fish, maybe even shorter with the evidence of a looping global warming. So um, I think about it in a way of, I told this until I spoke at a national public broadcasting interview and I just sp spoke about looking at through the salmon eyes and looking at through the salmon time clock. And that's four to eight years, you know, and we're looking at semi quasi extinction of a lot of stocks in the, uh, in the Columbia basin. And so, Time is of the essence that we all come together. You guys all know that. You think about what just happened um, over Northeast Oregon with the Imnaha, with those salmon there that were lost. Over 25,000 smokes were lost and not even going to the river that they were destined for. You know, so there's those things, sort of impacts that are real world. And so we need to come collectively together to understand how important it is, not only for us, but for everybody in this room and back here. So I come here in a good way, at the same time, the time is of the essence. It's important that we all come together and understand that need. And like I said, there's so many other impacts that are happening, you know, whether it's industrial, <coughs> recreational, but it can't be forgotten that we speak up here for those that can't speak for themselves. And we're up here for the protection of our first foods. And I say that in a, in, so that you understand that we have some of our first ceremonies that are first salmon ceremonies that are getting ready to happen and there's no salmon yet, you know, it's a late run. And so I just, you know, I pray for the creator that he brings that salmon forward and allows for those ceremonies to take place. Cause we pray in a good way for your half to your behalf as well. So I say that in a good way collectively that we need to come together. So it cuts the eye off for this time and I'm humbled to actually be here to speak. So thank you. I heard something uh, this morning about uh, bass, and I thought it was for all rivers. But we have a predator problem uh, with uh, fish, not only uh, bad, the smallmouth bass, but also 
uh, walleye and uh, uh, other catfish and all of the other species that in there that consume large amounts of smolts as they go into the river. And I hope our federal trustees are listening and expand their jurisdiction over those problems that are causing the smolts to be consumed by these fish that are not native to this area. The bird problems, they need to be taken care of. Fish and Wildlife Service, both sides of the, their compartment need to come together and understand what the fish population, what the bird population, what they are doing to protect the interest instead of being apart and not knowing what the other is doing to preserve these fish. All federal agencies need to come and, and sit there. I heard a statement the other day uh, when uh, that uh, Combe Basin initiative got signed by the president and, and the fellow uh, peoples on the Columbia River. There that uh, I always speak of the interagency and I heard that word again, interagencies came together to what, from within the Department of Energy. And I hope they fulfill those words, that interagency and those to protect and solve all of the problems, but I know it's not going to happen because of too many economies are going to be destroyed. I heard this morning, oh, our commercial fishermen are poor off. Our, our hotels and our gas places and our motels and grocery stores. If you look back and remember, salmon was our economy. And when... Uh, we lost 100% that we had. We lost 50%. But we still survived, adapted, and learned. And if the, the, what I hear from some of these uh, sportsmen in my area, that uh, I'm taken away from their recreational activities, salmon aren't toys. Steelhead aren't toys. All of the species are not toys. They are food source for my people. So I hope that uh, we can uh, remember those other predators in the Columbia River besides the Sacramento River. There's numerous. And if I'll remind you again, if there's no smolts, there's no fish to regulate in the ocean. With that, uh, I thank you for this time, and uh, I hope you understand our viewpoint because they, the salmon are not only our economy, but they are our medicine. When we had uh, all of our natural foods, the, the salmon, the berries, the roots, then... Uh, and uh, the deer meat, we were wealthy and healthy, but due to restrictions by the states of Oregon and Washington, we lost a lot of that. So please remember that they're not toys. They're not a dollar. They are a food source for my people. And think back, remember, when we had 100% control over those fish, there was over 20 million fish in that basin. And I hope you can figure out science isn't going to fix it. It's going to be the people and their actions of all of their profit-making ventures, all of their harvesting levels, are going to be the ones that make a difference. Thank you for your time. I just want to add a few words, you know, that uh, maybe the government, you know, like the 
Fish and Wildlife Service and everything else. Remember, not too long ago, within the last hundred years, how much how much animals that have been eradicated uh, for progress. You know, whether it's a wolves or buffalo or uh, any animals have gotten away of uh, progress in the United States. And now we have something that is really getting in the way uh, that needs to be eradicated, or not eradicated, but uh, taken care of. Uh, so when you look at all these programs that the U.S. government has done, and I don't know, I don't understand the reason why they would stop right at uh, when it comes time to protect a resource that's uh, disappearing. And uh, you guys were quick to move at the passenger prisons, the buffalo, wolves, grizzly bears, and even even our tribal people, if we got in the way. So you guys got a big opportunity here as a government agency to enact these uh, programs that you guys had before as a government entity and uh, do something. Otherwise, we're going to still be coming here two, three years from now talking about the same thing that needs to be done. You guys have that power to do these things, to start these things. Do it. Otherwise, we'll, you know, nothing will ever happen. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank all three of you. And uh, before you leave, I just want to make sure there's any questions or comments. Mr. Butch Smith. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And I, and I know a lot of people in this room heard what you had to say. And those are really wise words. And the tribes and all of us are spending hundreds of millions of dollars in recovering salmon. And I am too frustrated in feeding birds that have come to his, more than historical proportion, over historical proportion, um, feeding the most expensive bird food that you could, ESA listed salmon. And we have to do something about it. We cannot seems like we had the ball rolling about 10 years ago and and somehow the the ball got flat and just to keep having meetings about it just just to keep talking about it without any actions is as frustrated for us on the other side of the river as it is for you guys up there i live in front of an i live in front of an island that that harvests 25 million smolts a year that are getting to the ocean and they've made it through the whole gauntlet from from where you come from cleared almost inches from the ocean and they're picked off. And now we have a bigger problem on the Astoria bridge where they're all the way across. So your words are true and they're wise and I hear you. And if ever a time we can roll up our sleeves and get us fish and wildlife and the proper people in the room, give me the call and, and, and I'll be there at that meeting because we need to do something. It's, 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 just horrendous what's going on um, with with uh, the predators now on the river. So thank you. And, and I, we've heard what you said. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Butch. Further questions or comments? Not seeing any. Thank you, the three of you, for being here today and this week. Next, we'll move to our management and advisory management entity and advisory body reports. First, we have a report from the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation. Ms. Cindy Marshand is here. Good afternoon. Joined Thank by Mr. You. Casey Baldwin. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I'd just like to start by uh, saying thank you for, for the commission allowing us time on your agenda today. I know you guys are really busy and hear a lot of testimony. Um, again, introducing myself, my name is Cindy Marchand. I'm from the Colville Tribes. I am the secretary of the executive committee and I chair the fisheries committee there. 
Um, I just want to do a brief reminder of who we are um, for some of you who may or may not have been here the last time we met in uh, California, but the Colville Tribes it consists of 12 bands with lands reaching north of the border into uh, British Columbia up to Revelstoke and south into the Columbia River Basin, and we're bounded by the Okanagan and Columbia Rivers. The Colville Tribes is a federal federally recognized tribe with fishing rights in the Columbia River that are managed by you folks here at PFMC. So the Colville tribes are salmon people, we're river people, and salmon are very important to us. They're one of our first foods, as um, the gentleman here had uh, stated. They're, um, we've used the Columbia River since time immemorial. We use it for our ceremonies, practices, and all three of our dialects on the Colville Indian Reservation incorporate salmon in, into um, its stories, and it's very important to us. The Colville Tribes also works to do uh, habitat improvements um, and different salmon work. We spend millions on the restoration. We've been expanding our rep, rep, restoration into the Methow, Inia, and Wenatchee Basins. We're investigating the feasibility of removing the Enloe Dam in the Smilkami and working with First Nations in the spirit of increasing the salmon fishery. So specifically, we also have Chief Joe Hatchery, which produces up to 2.9 million Chinook. Uh, many are caught um, in the ocean in the lower Columbia. So we are doing our work uh, to contribute to the salmon fishery. And so we uh, just wanted to you know, be recognized for that and that um, we're very involved in the salmon fishery along the Columbia and even over in the Okanagan. So during our last testimony, we briefly discussed our escapement numbers. We would like to focus on that issue today during our time allocated with you folks. Uh, Casey Baldwin, who you had introduced earlier, is our senior research scientist, and he'll be discussing this more in depth. <clears throat> Thanks, Cindy. And uh, appreciate the council's time here to talk to you uh, again about uh, what we're anticipating for uh, 2024. Uh, in, in the report, uh, you'll see uh, we are recommending uh, that you pursue a conservative approach to the ocean fisheries uh, because of, um, for, for a couple of reasons, um, you know, there are some inaccuracies obviously in forecasts and last year's forecast was 30% was higher than, than the actual return as an example. Um, and, and uh, We've also have some issues. Um, you know, there was a, a flood in 2021 that's going to affect uh, returning integrated hatchery fish. And, and, and in the last several years, uh, we have not been able to harvest any uh, hatchery, except for a few jacks, but any adult hatchery fish off the purse standing operation, 100% of those hatchery fish and the natural origin fish are coming out of, are going to broodstock uh, and not to harvest. And so, there has still been some individual tribal member harvest, uh, but uh, but the purse standing operation, uh, you know, we're, we are, the Colville tribe is making sacrifices uh, at, at that local level in order to allow for escapement to the spawning grounds uh, in some of these years. And so um, the, the aggregate runs don't necessarily reflect some of the issues that are happening on the ground at the local level um, and at the end of the line. So we just wanted to make sure you understood where those uh, recommendations we're coming from. Um, with respect to the escapement objectives, and do we have that graph figure available? Cool, thank you. Um, it, it's not in the report, but I wanted to share with you, because uh, I think a picture's worth a thousand words. Um, some of the, the recent um, data for the, the abundance trend on Summer Chinook, and so we can relate that to uh, some of the comments in our report about uh, the escapement objectives and the conservation um, measures. Um, the w w this graph is from the um, it is from the Okanagan Work Group uh, of the Chinook uh, of the Pacific Salmon Commission, um, and and we put this in here to show uh, the major change in abundance and productivity that occurred with this Upper Columbia Summer Chinook stock starting in about 1999. Um, which coincidentally um, corresponds to the year in which 
um, the analysis was completed for the Chinook Technical Committee, which serves as as the um, uh, as the conservation measure for your fish management uh, plan. So your fish management plan uses the 1999 Chinook Technical Committee um, analysis. Um, and so essentially we have 25 years of much different abundance and productivity out of this stock than what your management measures recognize. Uh, and so that's why uh, it, it may, it, if it seems like there's a discrepancy between what we're saying in terms of we're not meeting escapement objectives on, on in certain tributaries or having a hard time collecting broodstock. Um, the hatchery programs have changed since 1999 um, and this number of 12,143 fish to Rock Island doesn't reflect increases in, in, in hatchery programs. For example, the PUD mitigation programs for the HCPs and the relicensing processes have increased uh, the brood requirements. Chief Joe Hatchery is a new hatchery that, that went online uh, and increased production in the Okanagan and the Columbia main stem after 1999. Um, and we just have a, we have a lot more uh, biological data on these tributaries about stock recruitment that is available and it's not being used um, and it hasn't been used in um, in any of the processes for whether it be the uh, Pacific Salmon Commission, uh, the PFMC um, or or the USV Oregon escapement objectives. Um, and the other thing we wanted to point out was sort of some inconsistencies with how the information is being presented. For example, in your reports, um, you're referring to this conservation objective that's coming out of the Chinook Technical Committee in 1999, but um, in practicality, we're using uh, to set the escapement objective and the harvestable surplus in this process, we're using the USV Oregon escapement objective of, of 29,000 to the mouth. And so when you read the reports, whether it's the 2020, you know, look at the 2023, um, summary. It says, you know, based on the geometric mean, three-year geometric mean, and the um, uh, and, and the minimum size threshold for the for the population. Um, you know, the population is not overfished, uh, but in reality, we're using a, a different number. Um, and so, it seemed like there are some inconsistencies that that could be cleaned up here um, with the reporting. Um, and so that, that's kind of one issue, the, the outdatedness of the data that is, is in the underlying escapement objectives and conservation measures is kind of the other issue. Um, and so th th that's sort of where we're coming from in, uh, in this report. Um, we wanted to just put that information, get that information on people's radar. We're not familiar enough with the various processes and, and um, committee processes to, to have necessarily a solution or a path forward. Um, but we think it needs addressed. I think, you know, five or 10 years of different productivity might keep an eye on it, but 25 years of, of, of different, uh, much different productivity, it's probably time to, to revisit these things and, uh, and figure out uh, what the solution is. Um, and I, I think that I'll, I'll stop there for now. I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, and see if there's any question. or actually hand it off to Cindy to wrap up. Yeah, we'd just like to thank you guys for allowing us on your agenda. Um, just reiterating what our uh, treaty tribes have said, um, you know, we're trying to develop this fishery for everyone, you know, get good size runs so we can all enjoy these fish and not just uh, for the recreation, but also for us um, tribal members to practice our ceremonies and to, um, you know, make sure that these salmon runs are are going clear up the river and out into the ocean. So we, again, appreciate um, your time. We appreciate you listening to us. Um, and we hope that we can uh, work together to uh, fix our, our issues. Lim -lim. Thank you very much. Uh, let me look around and see if there's any questions, comments from anybody here. I don't see any hands. Thank you, both of you, for being here. Thank you. Next, we will move on to our Salmon Advisory Subpanel Report. And because I believe there's a whole host of people to present, I will look to Mr. Richard Heap to introduce them and guide us through this. 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. We'll bring up the commercial folks first, commercial trail folks. Uh, we're here to present our management measure to you uh, for the final analysis and development of the final season. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to ask these guys a question. So having worked with the recreational representatives and the neighboring states, do you feel that your recommendations reflect an equitable distribution of the resource? Yes. Yes. Okay. With that, we'll begin with Washington and Ryan Johnson. Thank you. I'd like to present the SAS proposed um, commercial troll uh, season north of Cape Falcon. <clears throat> the overall non-Indian attack of 82,000 Chinook, 95,000 marked coho with a healed adipose fin clip. The non-Indian <clears throat> commercial troll attack of 41,000 Chinook, 15,200 marked coho. For fisheries scheduled prior to May 16 of 2024, see 2023 management measures which are subject to in-season action in the 2024 season described below. May 16 through the earlier of June 29, or 27,300 Chinook. Catch limits are in place for the following areas. U.S.-Canada border to the Queets River, no more than 7,240 Chinook. Led better to Falcon, no more than 6,340 Chinook. Landing and possession limits in place for the following areas. <clears throat> Landing limits will be evaluated weekly in season, and the landing week is Thursday through Wednesday. U.S. Canada border to Queets River, 60 Chinook per vessel per landing week. Queets River to Leadbetter, 150 Chinook. Leadbetter to Cape Falcon, 60 Chinook. Open seven days a week, all salmon except coho. Chinook minimum size limit of 27 inches total length. If the Chinook quota is exceeded, the excess will be deducted from the all salmon season. In 2025, the season will open May 1, consistent with the preseason regulations in place in this season above for May 16 through June 30, 2024. And this could be modified at the March or April Council meetings in 2025. July 1 through the earlier of September 30th, or 13,700 Chinook, or 15,200 marked coho, open seven days per week, all salmon. Chinook minimum size 27 inches, coho minimum size 16 inches, Alcohol must be marked. No chum north of Cape Alaba in August and September. July 1 through 10, landing possession limit of 70 Chinook and 100 mark coho per vessel for the open period. Beginning July 11th, landing possession limit of 80 Chinook and 100 mark coho per vessel per week, Thursday to Wednesday. Landing limits will be evaluated weekly in season. The last cell in the table here has um, the various conservation and closure areas. Um, landing restrictions, calling requirements, dealing with Leadbetter line, Cleats line, and uh, regulations for landing into Oregon. That completes North of Falcon. Good afternoon, Vice Chair, uh, Council members. I'm Mark Newell, Oregon Troll Rep. I'll be reading the uh, regulations for Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain. April 16th through May 29th, June 1st through 5th, 12th through the 16th, 26th through the 30th, July 26th through 30, August 4th through the 8th, and September 1 to the uh, October 31st. Open seven days a week, all salmon except coho, except in the non-mark selected coho fishery described below. Chinook minimum size limit of 28 inches total length, coho minimum size limit of 16 inches total length. All vessels fishing that area must land their salmon in the state of Oregon. Big gear restrictions and definition C2, C3. There's also landing, uh, some landing requirements that I won't read uh, for the coho. Beginning September 1st, no more than 75 Chinook allowed per vessel per landing week. Vessel limits may be modified in season. In 2025, the season will open March 15th for all salmon except coho. Chinook minimum size limit 28 inches total length. Gear restrictions same as 2024. The opening could be modified following council review at its March 2025 meeting. Excuse me. 
So I'm just going to interrupt and ask that, Mark, um, if you could go through the non-Mark Selective Coho portion of that. We, I think we just skipped right over that. It's underlined about halfway through on that. Okay. So thank yes. you. If you could just read that for us into the record. Sure. Sorry about that. Okay. Non-Mark Selective Coho Fishery, September 1 through the earlier of September 30th, or a 5,000 coho quota, no more than 50 coho allowed per vessel per landing week. If the coho quota is met prior to September 30th, then all salmon except coho season continues, mandatory reporting required as described below. Hello, good afternoon, uh, council and agency staff. Um, my name is George Bradshaw. I'll be reading the California commercial troll package. Um, you know, we'll start in the north, the Oregon, California border to the Humboldt South Jetty is closed. Um, in 2025, the season will open May 1 through earlier May 31st for a 3000 Chinook quota. Uh, Chinook minimum size limit of 27 inches Landing possession limit of 25 Chinook per vessel per week. Open five days a week, Friday through Tuesday, all salmon except coho. Any remaining portion of the Chinook quota may be transferred in season on an impact neutral basis to the next quota period. All fish in the area must be landed in the area within 24 hours of any closure. And prior to fishing outside the area, um, sea compliance requirements, gear restrictions as defined um, C2, C3. Klamath control zone is closed. Um, you know, this opening could be modified following council review at its March or April 2025 meeting. Uh, Humboldt South Jetty to latitude 4010 north is closed. The Fort Bragg zone latitude 4010 north to Point Arena is closed. In 2025, the season will open April 16th for all salmon except coho minimum Chinook minimum size limit of 27 inches, total length, gear restrictions, same as 2022, landing possession limits may be considered in season. This opening could be modified following council review at its March 2025 meeting. Point Arena to Pigeon Point, the San Francisco subcell is closed. In 2025, the season will open May 1st for all salmon except coho. Chinook minimum size limit again of 27 inches, Gear restrictions, uh, same as 2022. Landing possession limits may be considered um, in season. An opening could be modified in March or April of 2025. And moving down again to Pigeon Point to the U.S.-Mexico border, the Monterey cell is closed. Um, and in 2025, the season, the season will open May 1st for all salmon except coho. Chinook minimum size limit, again, of 27 inches. Gear restrictions, same as 2022. Landing possession limits may be considered in season. The opening could be modified following council review in its March or April 2025 meeting. Um, I also forgot to uh, read the Southern Oregon Humbug Mountain to uh, Oregon California border. April 16th through 30, open seven days per week, all salmon except coho, Chinook minimum size limit, 28 inches, all vessels fishing in the area must land their salmon in the state of Oregon. In 2025, that season will open March 25th for all salmon except coho, Chinook minimum size 28, total length and gear restriction same as 2024. That opening could be modified following council review at its March 20, 2025 meeting. Thank you. Red March 25th, they want March 1 and 5. March, to, uh, in 2025, the season will open March 15th. Okay, sorry. All right. Thank you. I'll look around and see if there are any questions for these gentlemen. Sharon Kiefer. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And first, I'll say this is my first time through this arena and the salmon management. I'm just curious 
Uh, I see a fair amount of consistency talking about minimum length of 28 inches. And now as we're moving on, it's 27 inches. I'm just curious, is there a particular management or biological basis for that? Oh, um, I think the consistency that you see is between states. Um, California has a typical 27 inch size limit um, where Oregon tends to go with the 27 or I mean 28 inch size limit. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions on the commercial troll proposed management measures? Not seeing any. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. We'll bring up the recreational folks now. So before we begin having worked with your commercial counterparts and your joining states, do you feel your uh, recommendations here reflect an equitable distribution of the harvest? Yes. 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 Thank you. We'll begin then with Washington. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the council. My name is Dave Johnson. I'm the Washington sport rep. I'll be reading from table two, page one. Overall non-Indian tack of 82,000 Chinook, 95,000 Coho, marked with the heeled adipose fin clip. Recreational tack of 41,000 Chinook, 79,800 marked coho. All retained coho must be marked. Buoy 10 fishery opens August 1 with an expected landed catch of 27,000 marked coho in August and September. U.S. Canada border to Cape Alava, the Nia Bay sub area, June 22nd to earlier of September 30, or 8,300 mark coho sub area quota with a sub area guideline of 9,430 Chinook. Open seven days a week, all salmon except no chum, beginning August 1. Two salmon per day, which only one may be a Chinook. All coho must be marked with the clipped heeled adipose fin. See gear restrictions and definitions C2, C3. In season management may be used to sustain season length and keep harvest within overall Chinook and coho recreational tax for North Cup Cape Falcon. Beginning August 1st, Chinook non retention east of the Benilla Tattoosh line during council managed ocean fisheries. Sea gear restrictions and definitions. In season management may be used to sustain season length and keep harvest within the overall Chinook and coho recreational tax. Cape Alava to Queets River, La Push sub area, open June 22 through earlier September 30 or 2070 marked coho sub area quota with a sub area guideline of 1,630 Chinook. Open seven days a week, all salmon except no chum beginning August 1, two salmon per day, which only one may be a Chinook, all coho must be marked with the heeled adipose fin. Queets River to Ledbetter Point, Westport sub area, open June 30 through July 11, open five days per week, Sunday through Thursday, open July 14th through earlier September 30, or 29,530 marked coho sub area quota with a sub area guideline of 17,430 Chinook, open seven days per week, all salmon, two salmon per day, no more than one, maybe a Chinook, all coho must be marked with a heeled adipose fin. Chinook minimum size limit in this area is 22 inches total length. Ledbetter Point, Cape Falcon or the Columbia River sub area, June 22 through earlier of September 30 or 39,900 marked coho sub area quota with a sub area guideline of 12,510 Chinook, open seven days a week, all salmon, two salmon per day, no more of one, which may be a Chinook. All coho must be marked with the heeled adipose fin. Chinook minimum size limit, 22 inches. That concludes North of Falcon. Good afternoon, Vice Chair, Councilman. My name is Mike Sorensen, Oregon Charter Rep on the SAS, and I'll be reading from page nine of the same document. Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain, March 15th to October 31st. One, open seven days a week, all salmon except coho, except as provided during the all salmon 
mark select coho fishery and the non mark select coho fishery. Two fish per day, Chinook minimum size limit 24 inches, total length, sea gear restrictions and definitions. Beginning October 1, the fishery is open shoreward of the 40 fathom management line. In 2025, the season will open March 15th for all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum si size limit 24 inches, total length, uh, the same gear restrictions has in 2024. The opening could be modified at the council meeting at the March 2025 council meeting. Cape Falcon to the Oregon border, Mark Select Coho Fishery, June 15th through the earlier of August 18th or 50,000 Mark Coho quota. Open seven days per week, all salmon, two salmon per day, all retained coho must have a healed a uh, uh, marked with a healed adipose fin clip, see minimum size limits, see gear restrictions and definitions. Any remainder of the marked select coho quota may be transferred in season at an impact neutral basis to the September non-marked select coho fishery from Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain. Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain, non-marked select coho fishery, September 1 through the earlier September 30th or 30,000 non-marked select coho. Open seven days, open days may be modified in season. Open seven days per week, all salmon, two salmon per day, see minimum size limit, see gear restrictions. I'm Richard Shape, the Oregon Sport Representative on the SAS. Uh, from Humbug Mountain to the Oregon-California border, the Oregon KMZ, May 16th through August 31st. Open seven days a week, all salmon except coho, except as provided above during the Mark Select coho fishery from Cape Falcon to the Oregon-California border, June 15th to August 18th. Two salmon per day, see minimum size limits and gear restrictions. Good afternoon, Vice Chair, Council and staff. My name is Jim Yarnell, California Sport Representative, and this is John Atkinson, the California Charter Representative. Continuing on the same document, Table 2, starting at the Oregon-California border to latitude 4010, the California KMZ closed in 2025. Season opens May 1 for all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size limit of 20-inch total length, and the same gear restrictions as 2022. This opening could be modified following council review at its March or April 2025 meeting. Continuing south from 4010 to Point Arena, the Fort Bragg cell closed with the same boilerplate information as the zone above. Continuing south, Point Arena to Pigeon Point, San Francisco, closed in 2025. Season opens April 5 for all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size limit of 24 inches total length, and the same gear restrictions as 2022. This opening could be modified following council review at its March 2025 meeting. Continuing south, Pigeon Point to U.S.-Mexican border, the Monterey cell closed in 2025. Season opens April 5th for all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size of 24-inch total length with the same gear restrictions as 2022. This opening could be modified following council review at its March 2025 meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for these gentlemen on the sport proposed sport management measures? I see no hands. Oh, excuse me, Jim. Um, my error um, in the Fort Bragg cell, I said that the boilerplate language was the same as the California KMZ, and it is except for the opening date um, in April. 5th of 2025 versus a May 1 opening day in the California KMZ. My apologies. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, not seeing any questions. Anything else, Richard? No, sir, that's it. All right, thank you very much. That completes all of our reports and takes us to, oh, excuse me, Marcy Uremko. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I was wondering when um, management entities were coming in E2E. I probably should have done that first. Uh, good point. I did not have that on my checklist here. So hang on just a second. Apologize for that, Marcy. If, if you have a report for CDDF, CDFW, please go ahead. Yes, I do. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And um, thank you to the SAS uh, as they um, had incorporated uh, much of the content of the report that I'm about to give here uh, orally. Um, came back from the March meeting and um, our department uh, spent some time carefully considering uh, the alternatives and the department has made the very difficult decision to again recommend closing ocean salmon fisheries in California for 2024. The department also strongly urges the council uh, for all council managed fisheries to minimize the impacts to Sacramento and Klamath Basin Chinook stocks. This year's SAC fall ocean abundance forecast is just over 213,000 adults. Yes, that's an improvement over last year's forecast of only 169,000 adults, but it's still the second lowest forecast on record uh, since the fishery was closed in 2008 and 2009. Uh, the performance of the abundance uh, forecasting tools um, add concern uh, when considering prosecuting fisheries in 2024, given the consequence of management error uh, would be uh, more severe when the projected harvestable surplus is so marginal. Um, last year, the preseason projected uh, escapement uh, when we left was 165,000 adults to return last fall. But in actuality, the postseason returns were only 133,000. And yes, while that's above the minimum spawn or escapement floor of 122,000, uh, that was with no fishing. And in fact, um, SAC fall narrowly missed an overfished determination in 2024, um, had escapement been only slightly lower than it actually was. Uh, turning to Klamath, uh, the abos uh, abundance forecast is 180,000 Chinook. Uh, while we did see some improvement in the forecast this year for Klamath Fall, uh, the stock remains overfished for the seventh consecutive year now. Yes, we met the escapement goal of 40,700 natural area adults uh, with over by about 900, just barely exceeding that minimum. Um, so barely, um, not substantially. Escapements to the upper Sacramento this year were very poor across the board for fall run, spring run, and winter run. Uh, the spring run returns in 2023 were actually perilously low, only 1,400 adults and only a hundred of those return to the natural area tributaries. Winter run, likewise, very depressed. Um, <clears throat> fall run returns in the upper sack, historically low. Um, 
the natural area adult returns, um, lowest two years on record consecutively in 22 and 23 with only 9,000 and just 6,200 fish respectively. So overall, there is some improvement in some instances from last season and perhaps some reasons for optimism. Uh, we continue to have widespread and abundant precipitation um, through the winter and into the spring. Um, we seem to be uh, enjoying some improvement in spawner returns for some stocks um, and things are looking up, but there's still just a long way to go. CDFW understands the significant impacts that fishery closures have on the people of California, but these abundance forecasts for our target stocks are, are just too low. Um, while the rainfall and the snowpack have improved, uh, the stocks and their habitats just need another year to recover. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Yeremko on the California report? Not seeing any questions. I will look around and make sure that there are no other management entity reports to be heard. And I'm not seeing any, so thank you. That completes our reports now and takes us to public comment. We had four signups. And the first one is in person, Brian McGinty. Brian will be followed by Dave Kushida. Brian says in person, unless he's, he's online. Brian, can you hear us? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, the recent termination of a volunteer from the Salmon Advisory Subpanel Committee from the Pacific Fishery Management Council marks a concerning departure from the values of open dialogue, truth, and democratic engagement that underpin our governance structures. This individual who has been remo removed from exercising their First Amendment rights has been a vocal advocate for the integrity of salmon management and the efficacy of the council's policies. <clears throat> it is essential to recognize that expressing dissent, especially when grounded in evidence and aimed at improving policy outcomes, is a cornerstone of effective governance and should not only be protected, but be encouraged. This committee member has not only spoken truth to power, but has substantiated their criticisms with detailed analysis and testimonies before the council. They have highlighted the shortcomings in management processes, identified the failures of current models to protect harvest rates, and pointed out lapses in strategies meant to ensure the long-term sustainability opinions, but our conclusions drawn from a thorough examination of the council's track record and the outcome of its policies. To dismiss such critical feedback is to undermine the very purpose of advisory panels, which is to, to provide diverse perspectives and expertise to inform decision making. Moreover, the claim of transparency and openness from the PFMC, particularly given its operation under the guidance of federal government necessitates a genuine willingness to engage with dissenting voices. Transparency is not just about the availability of information. It is about the openness of decision-making processes to scrutiny, critique, and improvement. A truly transparent process embraces dis disagreement as means to refine policies, ensure accountability, and build trust. It is through the rigorous examination of differing views that policies can be robustly tested and improved. The reluctance of the state of California and by extension the PFMC to meet the minimum criteria for transparency and to adequately consider the needs and requests of the fishing community not only erodes the trust in the council's decisions but also questions the legitimacy of its appointed members. When those at the helm refuse to engage openly with the advisory members, 
especially those appointed to represent a wide range of stakeholders. It signals a departure from the collaborative and inclusive ethos that should characterize public management of the natural resources. <clears throat> In summary, the removal of the committed and truth-telling volunteer of the Salmon Advisory Subpanel Committee is not just a loss to the individual, but to the entire framework of this fisheries management. It represents a missed opportunity to address critical shortcomings and to foster a culture of transparency, accountability, and collaborative governance. <clears throat> For the PFMC to fulfill its mandate effectively, it must not only allow, but also encourage discourse, even especially when it challenges the status quo. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. McGinty on his testimony? And I don't see any hands. Thank you again, Brian. Yep. Next, we'll have David Kashida. David will be followed by John McManus. David, good afternoon. Uh, there. <laughs> Vice Chair Hasselmer, council members, staff, thank you for having me. My name is Dave Kashida, and as a longtime sport fisherman, I would like to support Alternate A of the California Recreational Sal for the California Recreational Salmon Season. The ocean abundance supports this option, and it would be a chance for us to fish and continue a tradition of trying to catch salmon with our families and friends for the sustenance and recreation on a limited basis. If the modeling and science show that this option is viable, the vast majority of rec recreational anglers that I have contacted with support this. The other part of the recreational fleet, CPFE, doesn't support this due to economic and financial issues which private anglers don't have a stake in. The economic benefit for our sport fishing communities is an important part of many people's livelihoods and give those communities the ability to hopefully survive through and support, to survive through their support of and use of infrastructure for any sport fishing that is allowed. We are always asking for more time on the water and wish to trust the science and follow the process to move forward allowing us to utilize the resources without negatively impacting them. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Kishida on his testimony. And no hands. Thank you very much. Dave. Thank you very much. Next, we'll have John McManus. John will be followed by Tom Marking. John, can you hear us? Check to see if, is he online? All right. Um, let's go ahead um, and go to Tom Marking and we can come back to John. Tom, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair and uh, Council. Uh, I had some prepared statements, but I found an interesting question at the start of this uh, session where the SAS was asked, do you think these recommendations are equitable? And the answer, of course, was yes. And I find that interesting. I, you know, through my 12 years on the gap or so, my cohort in the SAS always worked with the organ to try to get some kind of continuity and equ equitability between the KMZ zone between Oregon and us. And, and I kind of find it interesting this year that, you know, that Oregon's allowed essentially alternative one to fish 50, you know, 200 trips, whatever, and we're allowed 2,200. Alternative two, they get 4,400 angler trips, we get 900. And of course, then three, they get 4,900, we get zero. And the impacts are fairly the close. I mean, I think they're like 27 or 28 angler trips per fish, and we're about, I think, 21 to 22, you know. So we have a little more success probably because we're closer to the river mouth. But, you know, in alternative one, we have 50% of opportunity, and alternative two, we have 26% opportunity, and, of course, alternative three, we have zero opportunity. And I just find it interesting that, you know, somehow it's determined that because we're going to catch 42 fish or 97 fish, that's somehow so disastrous to the fishery that we should have no opportunity whatsoever. And, and I just find that kind of appalling. Um, I mean, locally, we looked at, you know, direct expenses, probably 550000 
and you know ancillary expenses probably 1.5 million just to Crescent City and Trinidad and Eureka alone um, all, all over 40 42 to 97 fish and I just find that kind of hard to understand uh, and I noticed that I've been concerned about the California position since prior to the March meeting I mean the pre-council meeting the SAS representatives and the CDF were out of the box were saying no fishing this year. And it's like, well, why don't we wait until what's being presented before we, and, and it's been consistent all the way through, all the way through this morning. It's like, well, our recommendation is no fishing and we have no objection to Oregon catching whatever they catch. And, and I just don't see the equity here. I mean, I mean, we met our escapement last year somewhat, and our reward for that is we get no fishing once again. And it's like, I saw, watched this happen in 2009 where we had zero fishing here. All our fish were segmented, half sent up to Oregon, other half sent down to San Francisco, and they made a lot of money on those fish. And we were the, you know, we wore the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the tough shirt again, the male shirt. So I just don't understand that process. Uh, I guess I don't see from the records and the evidence that us not fishing is going to make it rebuild any faster than it is anyway, if it makes any difference at all. Uh, I just don't see any evidence uh, in the record to indicate that. And, and the, you know, the economic damage is so severe to us. That, you know, I mean, even 10 days on the water is considered just devastating to the fishery. So we wouldn't fish at all. I mean, I, I just, I just don't understand that. So, and the council is the only one that can address this because I, I don't understand CDF and W's logic. Uh, anyway, that's, it's kind of frustrating for us to watch this. Uh, I, I just don't see de minimis fishing impacts or have much significance to the fishery. And I, you know, I'm a fly fisherman. I go up to the Klamath River and I fish for trout and steelhead in the summer. And I watch nets floating down the river by you know, the, those that are entitled to use them and they drag out hundreds and hundreds of fish up on the bank every day. And I'm, you know, out there with my fly, catch me at least with little 10 and 12 ounce trout as I watch these fish get dragged out of the river. But somehow it's so critical that every single fish has to be sent back to the river for survival. So it's, I guess I've gotten a little bit jaded through time. And I, you know, it's just kind of frustrating and disappointing as a wreck fisherman. But anyway, there's nobody else that can address this except you, the council, and uh, take whatever action I guess you feel is appropriate. But thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. There are questions for Mr. Marking on his testimony. Corey Ridings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Tom, for your testimony. Um, as part of your testimony, you mentioned uh, the numbers 42 to 97 fish, I think is what you said. And I apologize if this was somewhere in the documentation, but I didn't see it. So I'm wondering if you could provide a little bit more background on where you got those numbers from and tell us a little bit more about them. Thank you. Oh, sure. Those are the projected impacts on alternative one. Uh, the projected impacts uh, for the for the Klamath uh, the Oregon portion would be uh, 191, ours would be 97. Alternative two, their impact would be 156 fish of Klamath fish, ours would be 42. And for alternative three, they would be 180, I think, and we were zero. So that's that comes right out of the the, uh, the documents from the from last month. Thank you. Further questions for Mr. Marking. <laughs> Not seeing any hands. Thank you very much, Tom. I'm going to circle back and see if John McManus can hear us. I see his name online, but I don't see a microphone or anything there. He's John, can you hear us? Okay, it doesn't appear you can. We don't see the mic, so... Nothing we can do there. Uh, John, we've got more salmon items coming up here through the week. Um, I encourage you to maybe reach out here and see what, uh, how you're trying to connect so we can hear from you your comments. So with that, that completes our public comment and all of our reports is going to take us into council discussion and action. 
let's take a break uh, so we can proceed through that work. Um, is 15 minutes okay? I'm seeing neither support nor objection. 15 minutes, let's be back here.
One minute warning. Let's move back to our seats. Someday I'll have Craig key up the uh, Jeopardy little theme, Final Jeopardy. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. We've completed all of our reports and public comment takes us to council discussion and action. Action is up there before us to adopt the tentative management measures that will require a motion. But before we get to that, let me look around for any hands, initiate discussion on this agenda item. I see no hands for any discussion. Do we have any motions? Anything we want to do here? <laughs> Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I am ready with a motion if now is the time. Now's the time that All can right. stimulate discussion. Please go ahead. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I move to tentatively adopt the ocean salmon fishery management measures for non-Indian fisheries as presented in agenda item E2E, Supplemental SAS Report 1, dated April 6, 2024, for STT collation and analysis, including the following additional guidance. Direct the STT to set the Sacramento River Fall Chinook river recreational impact projection at 27,500 Chinook. Thank you. That language as I read it looks accurate and complete. Do you agree? Yes. Thank you. Is there a second to that? Seconded by Kyle Addix. Please speak to your motion. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, we have the materials in front of us that we've considered under this agenda item, and this would um, begin the process of collating them. Um, <clears throat> with regard to the direction to the STT to set the Sac Falls Chinook River recreational impact projection, uh, I have a few words about that. Um, <clears throat> at the March meeting, you might recall that the council gave guidance to model the three alternatives under different sharing arrangements that showed a range of allocations between ocean and in-river harvest. After internal consultation with the department's inland fishery management uh, team and considering uh, the California Fish and Game Commission's authority and their policy oversight over the inland salmon fisheries in the Central Valley. The department would like to see um, <clears throat> the council allocate 27,500 of the 33,600 sack fall uh, surplus to the inland fisheries. And just a note on that number of 27,500, that is the remainder once you subtract out the projected Oregon impacts on Sacramento fall from the harvestable surplus of 33,600. So Oregon's projected impacts in Alt-1 uh, were right there about 6,100 fish. 
So 27.5 is the remainder. Uh, although uh, it might indicate that we're looking to allocate uh, 27,500 fish to river harvest in a year when we're recommending ocean fisheries be closed. Uh, that's not what's intended here. Uh, it is the department's desire and intent to recommend closures for in-river fisheries, just as we've recommended closure of ocean fisheries, so that all of these fish would contribute to escapement but we feel very strongly that we need to preserve the State Fish and Game Commission's authority to make that decision. Um, <clears throat> a council uh, decision today to um, put that uh, surplus all to escapement would preclude uh, the Fish and Games Commission's authority to make their decision independently. Um, but again, I want to emphasize that the preference is that the surplus be put to escapement rather than harvest by any sector. Um, and our intent is to allow as much of that sack fall surplus to, to pass to escapement. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Are there questions to the maker of the motion for clarification? Seeing no questions, discussion on the motion. Kyle Addix. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you, Ms. Yuremko, for the motion that covers the entire coast. I'll just speak briefly to the North of Falcon area. Um, just for some perspective, the quota levels that were in the SAS report were the middle option for Coho and somewhere between the, the middle and high options for Chinook. Um, as I said, we'll have ongoing co-manager discussions through the week. I'm hopeful that we can um, resolve the Coho um, stock issues pretty quickly. The Puget Sound Chinook list of stocks that I think today in the SDT report was the first time this year the council has seen that full list and the number of issues we have to deal with with some critically low abundance Puget Sound Chinook stocks. Those aren't impacted to a high rate in council fisheries, but as we work through the week, we will be looking to see what can we do to minimize the impact of council fisheries as we also craft inside um, Puget Sound freshwater and marine fisheries to make sure we're meeting that long list of conservation objectives. I don't know at, at what points in the week I'll have guidance for, for the um, council process, but we will have inside modeling that we'll want to look at at, at each of the salmon check-ins as we make progress um, towards our final package. Thank you, Kyle. Any further discussion? John North. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And uh, just speaking to uh, Ms. Renko's motion, I thank you for submitting that for Oregon. The uh, proposed alternatives in that package reflect the unanimous support for alternative one that we heard at the public salmon hearing, both commercial and recreational, um, for those the areas south of Cape Falcon to the Order. I appreciate the Oregon SAS members working to incorporate also what we heard about troll fisheries at that meeting where um, they wanted to uh, get some August opportunity, which I think required shift in some July, reducing some July time to get some August opportunity. Um, that's now in that package, as is some tweaks to the to the potential opportunity for um, commercial. Coho. Um, for all Oregon, this alternative provides us a starting point to work on the rest of the week. Um, we're still in that spot where we're trying to figure out how to leverage or how to access harvestable numbers of, you know, healthier Chinook and, and Coho off the Oregon coast while remaining within all the conservation measures. And it's not, not easy. So thank you. Thank you, John. Mark Gorelnik. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Hassemer. Um, at perhaps great personal hazard, I'd like to offer an amendment. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, on the second line, be the beginning of the second line, I would in insert commercial troll. Oh, it's, no, I mean, the second line of the motion. Not, And then after the 
it's in the next line after April 6, 2024. Insert. And for California Ocean Recreational Fisheries, Alternative 1, as set forth in Agenda Item C9A, Supplemental STT Report, March 2024. It's and then the number below um, where it says 27,500, uh, change that to 21,036. And uh, before we ask for a second, I want to see if, see if there's any uh, technical issues or. Uh... Can I ask you about California recreational versus California ocean? Um, it should be California ocean recreational fisheries. Just to be clear, we're talking about ocean, not inland here. We're talking about California and not other states. So I think it's clear from that STT report, um, we're, if we go to California Ocean Recreational, that's, I think it's clear from that. Ocean, that put the word ocean in there, just so there's no ambiguity. Okay, I'll ask you to look that over carefully and make sure that language is accurate and complete? I believe it is. Thank you. Is there a second to the motion? Seconded by Bob Dooley. Please speak to your motion. All right. So um, I, I know that um, there is a division here. And I honestly, I, I don't know if this motion to amend will pass, but I felt that I needed the opportunity to set forth um, a few things. And I'd first like to start with the management guidelines that govern our council. And I'll start with national standard four. Conservation and management measures shall not discriminate between residents of different states. If it becomes necessary to allocate or assign fishing privileges among various United States fishermen, such allocations shall be A, fair and equitable to all such fishermen, and B, reasonably calculated to promote conservation. And from our salmon FMP, which states, to maintain ocean salmon fishing seasons, supporting the continuance of established rec recreational and commercial fisheries while meeting salmon harvest allocation objectives among ocean and inside recreational and commercial fisheries that are fair and equitable. Fair and equitable pops up a lot. And in which fishing interests shall equitably share the obligations of fulfilling any treaty or other legal requirements such as conservation for harvest opportunities. Under the motion, by Ms. Uremko, we have an ocean fishery that takes place, an ocean fishery on the Sacramento Fall Chinook that takes place exclusively in Oregon, which is plainly contrary to National Standard 4. The conservation burden ought to be shared. Now, this isn't an, op, an, an objection to Oregon's proposed opportunity because the science, the FMP, and NIMS tell us that we can afford a careful limited harvest. This is a question of fairness and equity. And we have a California fishery that takes place, at least on paper right now, exclusively in the river. As with Oregon, this isn't an objection to some inland opportunity. It's a question of fairness and equity, as expressly called for in the fishery management plan. There is no doubt that California Chinook salmon are under pressure. 
There is no ambiguity about the reason. California water policies are decimating Chinook populations. We have an obligation not to compound the harm. Our FMP and the National Marine Fisheries Service provide constraints on harvest to ensure that fishing does not contribute to the further decline in the stock. As has been noted, our models are not perfect. NIMS has directed a substantial escapement buffer. Consequently, rel relatively few salmon are available for harvest. California salmon fish, commercial fishermen, as opposed to those in Oregon, believe that the available opportunity isn't commercially reasonable. I don't quarrel with that. Oregon's impacts on California, California fall Chinook are forecast to be about 2.9% of the estimated abundance. California's ocean impacts under alternative one are projected at 2.2% of that abundance. My amendment seeks to restore the 2.2% of forecast impacts from the recreational ocean fishery. Public comment from recreational anglers is overwhelmingly in support of a limited opportunity in the ocean. Nonetheless, we've heard from some about the need for every last fish to escape. It's very difficult for me to imagine a scenario where a 2.2% change in escapement could be material. In fact, escapement has proven to be a terribly unreliable predictor of production, at least for the last 20 years. In 2013, 406,846 Sacramento Fall Chinook escaped. In 2016, the progeny of that cohort, the postseason Sacramento index was only 205,317, a little more than half. And the escapement in 2016 was less than 90,000 fish. Three years later, those 90,000 fish produced a postseason Sacramento index of over half a million. And these are not isolated examples from the last 20 years. Inland environmental conditions are the primary determinants to reproductive success. Favorable conditions allow for good production, even with suboptimal escapement. Poor conditions result in poor production, even with abundant escapement. So it's hard for me to understand how increasing escapement by 2.2% will materially benefit stock rebuilding. On the other hand, businesses that rely on the recreational fishery will continue to suffer. Tackle and boat businesses and others that serve the recreational fishery aren't seeing any disaster relief. And we've heard from recreational anglers that they want an opportunity. For many years, our salmon fisheries have been constrained by ESA listed and overfished stocks. The Sacramento Fall Chinook is neither listed nor overfished. But for stocks falling into those categories, like the critically endangered Sacramento River winter Chinook, we are given guidance by NIMS. That guidance comes from carefully considered statistical and scientific analysis resulting in harvest control rules. For the winter Chinook, NIMS guidance in 2024 is to limit impacts to 12.3% or less. Even in the upper Sacramento, the fall Chinook is far more numerous than the winter Chinook. So it isn't clear to me how an additional 2.2% in forecast impacts for a total of 5.1% with Oregon's impacts should result in a closure in a non-listed, non-overfish stock when impacts of up to 12.3% percent would be allowed in a critically endangered stock and allowed impacts on listed California coastal Chinook and overfished Klamath Chinook are also far more generous. Now there are always management risks, but we're in the business of managing those risks. CDFW stated in March that it could manage a salmon quota system as it has for Pacific halibut. I think we need to take CDFW at its word with the notion that we may only end up with one opener if the number of fish taken in that first opener exceeds the quota set forth in alternative one. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. 
Let me first look around and see if there are any questions to the maker of the motion for clarification. Kyle Addicts. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I think I understand the intent of the motion, but as I read it, I don't think it takes any action on Washington or Oregon recreational fisheries as written. That's correct. This is directed to California fisheries south of Falcon. The original motion was to adopt the fisheries coastwide as written. This adopts commercial troll fisheries, but does not adopt Washington or Oregon recreational fisheries. All right, my apologies. I um, had assumed as in past practice, we're doing the state by state. So um, that was my bad, but um, if I could have permission of the second to withdraw and then make a minor change here, I would like to do that. The second agrees with that, so. And that and would be to insert the word California. Let's, before uh, make sure that it's, it's withdrawn. Okay, it's so withdrawn. Now so you have a new amendment. I, I will read this aloud, um, but I will tell you where I'm going to insert a word. I move to tentatively adopt the ocean salmon fishery management measures for California commercial troll non-Indian fisheries as presented in agenda item E2E, supplemental SAS report one, dated April 6, 2024, and for California Ocean Recreational Fisheries, alternative one is set forth in agenda C9A, supplemental STT report, March 2024, for STT coalition and analysis, including the following additional guidance. Direct the STT to set the Sacramento River Fall Chinook River recreational impact projection at 21,036 Chinook. And thank you. The language on the screen is accurate and complete. It, it is, but I, I, I would like to, before we receive a second, so we don't go through this exercise again, see if there uh, are any, or maybe we have a second and I have to go through this process again, but I think that if there are any questions about the language before we get a second, that would be helpful. Well, I, I will just note that this is now taking it state by state. So this yes. is only California. It's only California. All right. And that, that would be the impact of it. Yes. Is there a second? Seconded by Bob Dooley. And, and I think I've, I've spoke uh, to, uh, to the motion before. I just have to comment the change in the number of Chinook. Um, it relates to the 2.2% that would be taken. It's roughly 4,626 in the, in that, in the fishery that would be added. And that's, that's the explanation for the change in uh, the fish afforded to the river recreational impact. Okay, thank you. Again, I will look for questions to the maker of the motion for clarification. Phil Anderson. Well, I don't know where to put this, but this looks a lot like a substitute motion to me, not an amendment. This completely changes the original motion, changes the geographic scope of the original motion. I believe that it's a substitute motion, but I would defer to our parliamentarian. I'm assuming the original intent of the original motion was to be coastwide. I would agree that's a substitute motion. <clears throat> All right. As I stumble along here, I'd like to withdraw the motion and relabel it a substitute motion. It's agreed to by okay. the second. May and I'm hoping I'm not wasting everyone's time here, but <laughs> um, so this is a substitute motion now. And um, is it the pleasure of the vice chair that I read it into the record as a substitute motion? Uh, let's stick with our protocol and read it into the record. Okay, I should be able to do it by memory by now. Uh, I move to tentatively adopt the ocean salmon fishery management measures for California commercial troll 
non-Indian fisheries as presented in agenda item E2E, Supplemental SAS Report 1, dated April 6, 2024, and for California Ocean Recreational Fisheries, Alternative 1, as set forth in agenda item C9A, Supplemental STT Report, March 2024, for STT collation and analysis, including the following additional guidance. Direct the STT to set the Sacramento River Fall Chinook River Recreational Impact Projection at 21,036. And as I read that, it's accurate and complete. Do you agree? I do agree. Is there a second? Seconded by Bob Dooley. All right, I'm not going to belabor the point here, and I appreciate that um, that uh, some in the room may be un uh, unhappy with this. I think it, this substitute motion is a vehicle for me to express my concerns over this process. Um, and uh, while I would hope it would pass, I certainly understand if it doesn't. And um, I'll be happy to answer any further questions. Thank you. Further questions for the maker of the motion for clarification first. Look very carefully. Phil Anderson. Just want to make sure I'm clear this this motion would have a series of very short openings in the month of June, July, August, September, and October. Is that correct? That's correct. In all three air management areas that are south of the Oregon California border. Right. I believe the, the opportunities are equal in each of the areas. Thank you. Further questions for clarification? Not seeing any discussion on the motion. Phil Anderson. I had a question for uh, Ms. Yuremko, um, and that is there There was in some of the discussion around this motion, there was the indication that California Department of Fish and Wildlife either had the ability or would be willing to uh, track the catches by opening and it would have the ability to close the fishery if the total amount of the fish taken were in excess of the amount that it's best that is anticipated in the motion. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Um, as I recall, the way alternative one is presented, there is a harvest limit for pre-September fisheries. I believe it's 10,000 Chinook and then a different harvest limit uh, for the post-September fisheries of 5,000 Chinook. So the way it would work would be the first open period would be prosecuted. Then we'd stop and count, um, determine a, an estimate of catch relative to that harvest limit, uh, consult with our SAS as necessary, um, if in-season action would be necessary to close the remaining open periods that are scheduled, then if that answer was yes, then we would uh, connect with National Marine Fishery Service and ask for an in-season call to recommend uh, scratching the remaining open dates. Thank Hopefully you. that answers. It does. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Further discussion on the motion? Corey Ridings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Mr. Grelnick, for providing this. Um, I agree uh, with much of what he said, including concerns about fairness between Oregon and California. Um, I will not be supporting the substitute motion, however. Uh, the margins and the number of salmon we are talking about are incredibly low. Uh, there is a lot of uncertainty in the environment and we're trying very hard with models that have high uncertainty and need a lot of work. And even more important in my mind, the proposed in-season management measures that Ms. Uremko just spoke to are untested and I believe uncertain. Um, going only on what my, my neighbors will do if there is a salmon season, um, I have concerns about blowing through those numbers. 
Um, I want to support a small angling season because it's important to support a salmon culture in California, and that includes recreational fishermen. History is long, though, and we have good reason to believe that this trend will turn around and provide opportunity in the near future. So again, I thank Mr. Grelnick for this, um, but will not be voting for it. Thank you. Further discussion? Butch Smith? Well, that exercise made, made my head hurt, but Mark, Mark's done that a lot of times to me over the years, but I, I'm not speaking for or against at this time. I, I don't, I don't even know what state I'm in right now, but, um, my, my, uh, my, my, my wondering is, um, and California's got a great management team, but if you'd really be one, uh, ready for the type of derby fisheries that would potentially show up and um if the fish were there and biting um you know possibly a a, a quota that low could be gone over pretty fast and, and i i don't have the answers i just wondered if you have an estimate on that because california's we've been taught has a very big coastline we're in a lot of places to go in and out and land salmon that that, that would just be my question and, and and thank you for your motion, Mr. Gorelnik. Okay. Was there a, a question, a specific question directed at someone? I would just ask uh, Ms. Remco if, if they have any idea what angling um, <laughs> numbers to anticipate. In a, in a derby style fishery like that. Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Butch. Um, I can't give you precise numbers, but what I can say is it is certainly reasonable to expect there would be effort shift into these very short open periods. If they are the only open days, if people want to go salmon fishing, that's when they would go. Um, as noted, the uh, <clears throat> alternative one proposal does open all of the California coast for those days at the same time. So we wouldn't expect folks to need to uh, drive north or south um, to have access to um, only a few ports, for example. Um, I think what we can say is that uh, I believe the highest, highest Chinook catch that we've witnessed, um, at least in recent times, um, talking about a full month period, fully open, uh, was in a month of July where I believe we had 40,000 fish taken in the month. And again, that was a, a 30 day open period. Um, if I may, I'd like to turn around and look at my staff and see if there's any additional information we might offer. Okay. That That's about all I can tell you at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? Susan Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Grelnick. Um, we have focused a lot on the impacts to Sacramento in the proposal. I'm just curious if you have looked at the potential impacts um, to um, either the California Coastal Chinook or um, the um, Trinity River, for example, that I notice are both either up against or over their objectives under al or, uh, objectives under alternative two. So I'm just curious, I mean, as we're working our way through this, if you have a sense of um, what those might be. Thank you. Um, I don't know that I can put the numbers at my fingertips immediately, but I recall them being fairly de minimis. Uh, I know the Trinity, um, component was 0.1 or 0.2 of the, the, the against the 16% cap. I think that the Harvard, the, the uh, age four Klamath was also pretty de minimis. Um, 
as a proxy for the California coastal. I, but I, I don't have those numbers uh, immediately at my fingertips. So I apologize. If you give me a few minutes, I can find those. Right, while well, Mark is looking for that, Phil Anderson. I had one more question for Ms. Jeremko. Um, that is, um, I hope this is a fair question. Uh, do you, would you anticipate that um, your director would be recommending to your commission that the in the river non Indian fishery would be closed if the ocean was closed? Marcy. Thank you, um, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you for the question. If if I wasn't impeccably clear in my earlier testimony, it is absolutely uh, the department's intention to recommend to the Fish and Game Commission that in-river fisheries be closed, presuming ocean fisheries are recommended to be closed by the council. Thanks. Any further discussion? Mark, have you found what you're looking for? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I did find the uh, Trinity component um, for the uh, California uh, sport fisheries um, under alternative one, it was 0.1%. I think I'd have to go back and look at the tables in preseason two to see the component of H4 Klamath in the um, sport fishery. But um, I know that, that uh, generally speaking, they're a small fraction of what they are in the commercial fishery. So, but I can't give you an exact number off the top of my head. Susan Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Gronlick. I appreciate you doing the, the heavy lifting to find the numbers there. Um, I guess the comment I would just make is, given the status of those populations and the fact that we're already over them, um, I would not characterize any even small amount of impact as de minimis in the sense that we're looking to try to meet those objectives in the next few days. So um, just, a, just a reminder there of the importance of it. Thank you. Further discussion? I don't see any hands, so I will call the question on the substitute motion on the screen before you. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. 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 Abstentions? Abstain. <laughs> Mr. Executive Director, I could not discern the number of in favor and opposed. Would you please do a roll call, roll call vote? Happy to hear, Mr. Vice Chairman. Just uh, give me one minute here. Okay, I'll be working off of voting sheet number one uh, regarding motion I'm referring to as the E2 substitute motion. Kyle Attix. No. Krista Svensson. I'm going to abstain. Joe Oatman. No. Mark Gorelnik. Yes. Sharon Kiefer. Abstain. Susan Bishop. Abstain. Robert Dooley. Yes. Butch Smith. No. Phil Anderson. No. Corey Writings. No. Marcy Uremko. No. John North. Abstain. Brad Pettinger. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
And Mr. Vice Chairman, I have uh, three yes and six no, so the substitute motion fails. All right. Thank you, Executive Director Burden. That takes us back to the primary motion or main motion that was before us. And I just want to make sure this is exactly the language that we started with. Uh, that appears to be correct. So discussion, further discussion on this motion. Not seeing any hands for discussion. I will call the question on this one. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Do we have further motions here? Joe Oatman. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll wait a second while the motion gets displayed on the screen. Thank you. For Tribal Ocean Fisheries in the area north of Cape Falcon, I move for the following tentative option to be analyzed by the salmon technical team or Chinook quota of 42,500, a coho quota of 42,500. This option consists of a May, May June Chinook directed fishery and a July, August, September all species fishery. The Chinook quota will be split 50-50 between the May, June and the July, August, September time periods. Thank you. That language appears complete and accurate. Is that correct? It is, Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you very much. Is there a second to the motion? Seconded by Kyle Lannix. Please speak to your motion. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Uh, Vice Chair. Uh, so the tribes uh, feel that this is a reasonable option for treaty trawl that is mindful of the management objectives of Chinook and Coho salmon stocks in light of their 2024 projected abundances. Um, I would also like to state for the record uh, that there are ongoing discussions uh, among the tribes in the state of Washington in which uh, they will evaluate uh, the total impacts of all proposed fisheries on coastal Puget Sound and Columbia River stocks. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you. Questions for the maker of the motion for clarification? Not seeing any questions. Discussion on the motion? Not seeing any hands for discussion. I'll call the question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Joe. With that, my checklist is complete, but the one that matters is the one Robin has. Robin? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, we've done a lot under this agenda item, but you have worked through it well. Uh, we've heard from the STT. They gave us an update on the impacts uh, associated with the, uh, the March uh, alternatives and how they've changed now that we're here in April. Uh, you've heard the summary of the public hearings that the council hosted um, in March after uh, we uh, adjourned the council, March council meeting. Uh, you've heard from the Pacific Salmon Commission reports. You've heard from North of Cape Falcon Forum and their recommendations and the work they are continuing to do as we move through this April council meeting. Uh, you've heard from our tribal governments and from man management entities as well and uh, additional public comment. Um, and so with that information, you have um, made two motions, one to adopt the uh, SAS recommendations under E2E with the further guidance uh, to STT to add 27,500 um, sackful fish. No. 
however it's written in the motion, sorry, it's not in front of me, but to uh, make that one change. And then also we've heard from uh, the tribal uh, representative to uh, include uh, their their motion on the number of Chinook and Coho uh, to start modeling for. So with that, you've completed your work. The STT will start uh, their modeling process now and get that report uh, out uh, as soon as possible. And I believe we're back uh, here tomorrow to uh, look at those results. All right, thank you, Robin. Before we close it out, let me just look around, make sure there's no other closing comments. Not seeing any, that completes this agenda item and I pass the gavel back to the chair. <coughs> Okay, great work, uh, Vice Chair Hasselmer. Um, turn to you, Dr. Burton, to see if uh, is the announcements. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, no major announcements this afternoon. Uh, just to say, good work. Uh, made short work of a long agenda today. Uh, this evening at six, we do have a chair's reception uh, again, just right out here, uh, starting at six p.m. Hope to see most, if not all, of you there. Otherwise, we'll see you tomorrow morning. Okay, we'll see you tonight and we'll see you tomorrow morning at eight. So, all right.